Hello, everybody. My name is Ian Kirk Patty Cake. I'm an author, idiot, and a loin streamer. And today we're taking a break from the ALA books because we have made <laughs> it to the end of the 2021 list. So we're taking a break from critiquing those books to take a look at a book by another YouTuber. His name is Eric July. He is a comic book writer now. He is a political opiner who talks about the comic book industry, movies, and the political slash progressive opinions on that side. And he also focuses on going after detractors. But and music, get, randomly. And, oh yeah, and he also does music. Um, but before I get into that, I would like to introduce my guest for today. She will be helping with the, or, or being part of a conversation on this book. <laughs> Yep. Hi, I am Galneth, or a lot of y'all are going to know me as Monty from the server or Montana. Um, I have been around for a while, not necessarily a YouTuber, but I am an avid reader and I love stories and I love stories when they come to me in any kind of form, if they're good. Um, but um, other than that, you know, we're working together on projects and I'm considered Ian's writing partner now, which is really nice. And so we're going to go ahead and go through this book because I have thoughts. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm excited to do this. I'm a little nervous, but I'm excited. <laughs> well, get it. So a couple of things before we get started. Number one, if you enjoy what I do here on the channel, please remember to like, share and subscribe for more. Number two, if you would like to be featured on the channel, check out the links down in the description below. Number one way to be featured is through Lemoy, the monthly prompt writing contest where I give you a prompt. You write a short story for the prompt and on the first Monday video of the month, we read some of those responses and bask in the creativity of this community because there is a lot of great creativity here. The second way is if you're an indie author and you have a book out or a book that is coming out, you can submit your first chapter and cover below and they will be read here to hopefully help you find more readers because that is the hardest part for anybody. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then it's a the struggle. The third thing is, if you would like to check out any of my books, you can get them anywhere that you get books, including your library. If you request them, feel free to hate on them if you so choose. I won't cry, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I'll cry for you. I'll cry. I'll cry. So don't worry. So, I'll do it. So there's, there's, I wanted to add another thing because I meant to say this with your self-introduction. Not only are you a storyteller of the written word, but you're also a fantastic artist. That, yes, I, I am. I, I, I personally think I'm mediocre, but a lot of people think I'm amazing. But I'm just like, listen, there's it's so the much blindness. character. <laughs> that is our blind. There's so much character in what you draw, though. And I think that's what makes the difference between a mediocre artist and like a superior artist. Because right. you don't have to have the greatest realism or the, the most secure style. If you can convey character in the way that you draw, I think that's a step up from other people that draw sterility. Absolutely. I have a, I know somebody that um, has this beautiful artwork. She's a fantastic colorist, but her artwork is very stiff. No shade to her. I love her very much. It's just something that she has had an issue with over the course of her time drawing. I have an issue with drawing noses the way I want to draw them, but everyone loves the way I draw noses. <laughs> but y'all, what y'all don't know is that, that that's me not knowing how to do the nose correctly. So they all turn out to look that way. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I have always said that like, I don't care if it's not proportionate or if it's inaccurate to like anatomy, you can always tell when somebody's learning and what I find to be remarkable is just whenever somebody can convey to me, no matter how early on they are in their journey as an artist, if they can convey to me the characterization and the emotion of their character, that is a step ahead a lot among a lot of people that are learning how to draw. Because that's something that a lot of artists starting out do not know how to capture right away. And it is a step up and it's only going to help you as you go along through your journey. And that's absolutely something that I truly believe in. If you can capture fluidity, like the color or whatever, if you understand color, even to the slightest bit, like it does help you in the long run. So really it's about your personality and how much your personality translates through your work mm -hmm. and how you see things because you can really see and feel somebody's thoughts and feelings, even if you may not understand or know what they're thinking at the time, but you can feel it coming at you from what you're looking when you're looking at something. I think you really can. I think that's what I much more appreciate in general about the the 2D animations that Disney used to be known for as opposed to them now doing all of the 3D animations because there's oh, yeah. so much more personality and you have, you can see 
the artistic director and the, mm -hmm. the artists in the 2D, but then in the 3D, everything looks the same. It does, and they're even following the same sort of stylized 3D models in most of their newer work. Um, whenever I look back at those old Disney classics, I look at the backdrops, those hand-painted backdrops. This is the craftsmanship of the way they're doing that and the way things are painted and colored has just always been so endearing to me. And that's why I feel like there's a reason why that's timeless and a lot of these newer films just are not. They're of the time, but they're not timeless. Nobody's going to really remember a lot of these films as time marches on. So for anybody that hasn't read Isom yet, if you want to read Isom and still have it be a surprise to you, then come back to this video later because we're going to go through the story beat by beat so that when we give comments on something, you understand where we're coming from and you're understanding the story as it was perceived by us. Now we're going to go through the story and leave comments as we go. And then at the end, we are also going to have separate sections to talk about character and setting and the art specifically um, outside of the context of the story. So the book opens up two weeks ago uh, with the caption of two weeks ago, cops at a yeah. precinct are complaining that the government officials are taking credit for the lower crime rate in the city and are being forgotten. Some of the guys out in the hall are gossiping about the redheaded chick uh, and Alpha Corps when they get yelled at. A random woman approaches the captain saying, she's back. This and <laughs> um, this is where we run into our very first problem. I have to point this out. It says two weeks ago, um, maybe that should have been an indicator to us that we probably weren't going to see what happened, but the next page shows us Avery, um, and we don't actually get to see what happened two weeks ago. We don't actually get to see who she is. Now, the only person that I can assume she is, is this character that we run into several pages later. But if it's not the she, who the titular she who is mentioned, then we never see the titular she. If it's not that character, then who is it? Because I don't know. There's no real importance to this scene at all. It's just setting up some sort of political drama that's going on within the city. And it has no bearing on the rest of the story at all. It really doesn't. And one of the problems with this specifically is so we can consider these three pages as basically a prologue. Yep. So your prologue should be out of, out of the time of the the main story that's why it's a prologue because it doesn't fit into the timeline of the main story but it should be introducing something that is going to be important to the main story now i understand if introducing yara this way is the way of saying hey she's going to become a thing in the future but with the way that this is a first issue then we should be focusing on what in what elements need to be introduced to introduce us to this world and to avery and to the idea of isom and if yara's not important to the setup of and the and the drama of this first issue she needn't not be involved in the introduction no, of the story. She it's really just a mislead. Be. It's just a mislead. It really is. And it, it 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 just it stands to show that I'm just like, I'm not sure if this was done out of like trying to seem more adult by opening up with some sort of political scheme. Because it is starting with politics and the the governor is trying to take, you know, credit for, you know, all the lower crime, which you just mentioned before. Um, and it starts with these police officers with the um <laughs> The John Jonah Jameson look-alike, which I can only ex suspect that that's an homage to that character from Spider-Man. But um, we never see this character again. And um, maybe we'll see him in the second book, but... Maybe. We'll see. But it just um, goes to prove that this is not an important thing for the first book. And it no. could have possibly just been, if depending on what Yara's role is in the second book, it probably could have been the prologue in the second book if she becomes more important in the second book. Because your I, prologue should have weight on what the rest of the story is about. Yeah, exactly. And I would really have liked to have known what went on for those two weeks with Yara, which it's funny you're calling her that because I kept calling her Yia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I kept calling her. And I was like, I can't read, man. <laughs> The, um, the other thing with this is the caption of two weeks ago is really awkward. At least mm -hmm. it was for me because you get, this is three pages in when you get the scene skip to earlier. Mm -hmm. Now is earlier, earlier from that two weeks ago. That's is, what I want to know. Because that's the implication. What would have been better here is to just have it open. If you were going to do this, say whatever you have to say for this, not even put a date on it. Just say, you know, whatever city hall or whatever police precinct and then yeah, when you get so, to avery say two weeks later 
exactly. And now, that would have been more straightforward. And I'm trying to think now, because I, I didn't actually put that together until you just said that. I was like, wait a minute. So earlier in the two weeks ago, okay, so is this whole comic taking place two weeks before whatever is happening is happening in the future, which might probably be in the second issue. So is this whole book just a prologue to what's happening in the main events of the, the, the story? Because that seems a little strange to me. So I all see, this I, stuff- I have no idea if earlier actually has to do with two weeks ago, or if earlier is like two weeks later in the future, but earlier in the day. That could like, be true. It's not um, clear. It's not clear as to what it's supposed to be like it really isn't clear at all i'm just like i really don't know and i didn't even notice the earlier thing i was just reading the dialogue and looking at you know the what's happening here on on the farm because we're now with mr avery silman um mm -hmm. our main character who is working out on his farm and that's pretty much all we see him do on his farm uh, yeah, just he's a, just hitting a punching bag he just hit a punching bag on the farm and his sister calls him and immediately, the first thing that we are met with whenever we finally get some sort of characterization of Avery is that he's not very nice. <laughs> no, he's not. He's not very nice. So, um, and he doesn't got to be. But his sister calls him and says she needs his help. And you know what she's met with? A big fat no. I'm not helping you. Doesn't even know what she's going to ask him for or what she needs help with. Um, he just tells her no. And then that's the end of that until she convinces him to do something, which, by the way, is under the threat of if he doesn't do it, then Mama's going to get mad at them. <laughs> yup. So, His uh, whole motivation is, I don't want to be scolded by Mama. I better go yeah. and do this. It's not I even, better. I care about my sister. It's not even, I'm worried about Jasmine. It's, I hate the city, but I, I hate being scolded by Mama more. I better go. Oh my gosh. That, oh, that whole thing about his sister calling him and then him not wanting to do it no matter what i was like okay so what really is this connection here because it's like it talks about mrs newman which is jasmine's mother this girl who is subsequently gone missing because she had an internship with uh his avery sister's uh place of work or place of business called projexus but it sounds like it's saying pro Jesus. So, <laughs> and I thought it was pro Jesus. I thought it was pro Jesus. I was like, is that supposed to be pro Texas? Because like, I feel like an idiot not being able to like understand. But maybe that makes sense because when you later see Isom's suit, there's like a cross near his crotch. I'm like, that's true. Is this man religious? Because that's a very awkward place to put the cross. <laughs> But you I thought what, that that You know what he means when he says bow before the cross. Oh no. <laughs> In the name of the Lord. <laughs> but yeah, I, I pointed out like, is this her calls and needs his help? And just the, the response is a blatant no without even knowing why or what the problem is just sort of shocked me. Because I mean, is it we don't know this and, and we we don't all have to know this, but um Maybe his sister calls him from time to time and she has him do all these ridiculous errands that turn out to be nothing, but we don't even know that. All we see is just him being pissed off about it, that he's got to go into the city because he willingly left. See, and, and that's, that's something that I didn't think about, but should be taken into consideration too, is theoretically she trusts him enough that she's like, okay, I have this issue. I'm calling you to help me deal with this issue before I call mm -hmm. the cops. But yeah. he also hasn't been to town since like, she lost her husband yeah because he I... hates the city so like do they have a close relationship or don't they because he gets out of the hospital later we'll find and she comes to pick him up immediately yeah. but like so does she ever call to talk to him is he always this cold when she calls to talk to him does she ever ask him for favors does he ever ask her for favors like there's yeah. no real idea of their relationship and the way they interact one it's so short we don't have any time with him establishing his relationship on his farm <clears throat> with his employees and we don't have really any idea of his relationship with his sister because it's so cold and he's so shut down to I don't want to help you I really yeah, don't want anything exactly to you. and the, and it really is like the sorriest motivation and it doesn't seem like Avery has any real connection to Jasmine and I even said in my notes that like 
it just seems like, well, Mrs. It says that, oh, Mrs. Newman never missed a day of service. Mom sure would kill me if I didn't help her. So he's not even doing this to help his sister or Jasmine or even Mrs. Newman. He doesn't want to get scolded by his mother. So, <laughs> but then it's like a girl is in possible danger because not only that, uh, Altana um, Avery's sister mentions that, well, Jasmine has fallen in with this character named Darren, who we can only assume is trouble. And they know Darren. Uh, Darren and Avery were friends in high school and close at one point. We don't really know the history of that. Granted, we don't need to see that either. That's fine not knowing that. But um, Avery is, you know, I don't know what connection he has to this other than he just don't want to get yelled at by his mama. And that's yep. it. So, so this is supposed to be our inciting incident. We should have gotten a little bit of more time to settle into his perspective, to get an introduction to his character, what his status quo is right now, because this is becoming the status quo interrupter. And that's usually how you would start out any story is you kind of get people, you introduce people to the world and what is sort of normal for them. And then you mm -hmm. introduce the weird element, because if you yeah. don't do that or the, the interruptive element, because if you mm -hmm. don't do that, then the reader doesn't really have a way to build a relationship or an expectation of who this no. character is. And if we'd gotten to see Avery interact with the farmhands, interact with Jim and mm -hmm. doing work instead of working out, we could have actually visibly seen him be a hard worker. We could have yeah. seen him how much he cares about the farm, how much he cares about his coworkers, how he gets along. But instead, we have him isolated, alienated, working out on his own. And, and then, then he gets a call from his sister who is like, hey, will you help me? And he's like, nah. No. So, like, What's that got to do with me? Yeah. I'm just like, damn, man. Like, your sister's calling you and she just lost her husband. Like, but not only that, but it, it also prevents us from actually kind of being endeared to Avery. And that's mm -hmm. what you want from your audience. Regardless of how your character's personality is, this could have a better writer could have easily have turned this character into a hilarious one that he's just this dude who wants to work hard on his farm and just want to be left alone, doesn't want to deal with the drama. And it could have been one thing, maybe Jasmine's been a, a troublemaker the, her entire life and Jasmine's in trouble again and he doesn't want to help her out. Like, there's nothing that indicates any reason why Avery shouldn't help this girl in some way because his sister needs his help because someone is in danger and that really really bothers me in fact like he sure takes his time getting to the city he goes in he takes a shower he brushes his teeth he tells jim or sam or whatever old mcdonald's name is that he's going to be going into the city and he'll be back later but so and so's order is going to be ready and he'll be here at six so it would have been, like you said, nice to see him actually working his farm with his employees, living this comfortable but hardworking life away from all this trouble and drama and city atmosphere and get and whatever else there is in the city that is unpleasant. It would have been nice to see that. But instead, we just see this lone wolf who doesn't want to do a damn thing, but is under <laughs> it is fearful that his mom is going to yell at him. So he ends up doing it anyway. I just thought that that yeah. was ridiculous. And see, it also would have endeared him a lot more if he had, had at least recognized like why his sister was worried because she's like, you know, Jasmine might've been trafficked. She doesn't say it that straightforward, but she hints that she might be trafficked. Yeah. She, she in the main it's possible like that. And he could have been like, okay, I don't want to go back to the city, but I will look into this for you because you're worried and I care about you. And yeah, I will look into this for you. Like that, yeah. even if he was reluctant about it, that still is a better motivation than I don't want to be scolded by mama. <coughs> yeah. I don't... It would have given an also um, any motivation other than I don't want to be scolded by mama. Any interaction with sister would mm -hmm. have helped to justify where at the end of this section where he's finally leaving the farm to go check out the city, he says, I got away from all of that. Yeah, so he's stopping needed, his way. <laughs> we needed more of something to build. What did he try to get away from? And if yeah. he actually focused it on, I got away from the city because the city is dirty and I know it's dirty. And I was hoping that the, you know, to stay away from the drama, mm -hmm. but his sister called and says, Hey, I need your help. You know, this chick is trafficked. And he's like, gosh, dang it. I don't want to do this. I tried to get away from all of that, but I also can't in good conscience ignore this. Yeah, exactly. So that would have endeared him so yeah. much more, even if he's still arrogant later. Yeah. Just that little bit of something would have helped. Oh him. my God. Later is just outrageous. <laughs> and okay. being, being more specific also would have helped to raise the stakes. Cause here it's very vague of, <laughs> I, I wanted to get away from all of that. Doesn't really explain yeah. what 
Avery was really trying to get away from. Yeah. Which you don't have to give us all of the details, but you've got to no. give us enough that it feels like there is purpose behind the stakes and just why he's so desperately wanting to stay out of the city that he will yeah. even not go and see his sister and his niece. Exactly. And I feel like it's also really heavily relying on the audience just to assume that, well, most farming people really fucking hate the city. So why would they want to go to it? But that's really, again, like this has been the shoddiest reason I've ever seen any character motivated to do anything. Um, and he pretty much the whole time is just very unhappy that he is doing this. Yep. It actually oh. even ends with. Still, I find my way back to that damn city, which I, I think it would have been better and made more sense because in the setup of that, it doesn't really make sense. No, it but not really. He should have said the city is calling me back. Yeah. Because that's actually what happened is his sister called him to come back to the city for help. Yes, I agree with that too. Because yeah, like help, please. Someone's in trouble. And also messing with crime lords, and which we can only assume Darren is some form of crime lord, even at the very start of this. Like Darren's dangerous. Um, when you mess with trafficking victims, like that is a risk to your life. It really is. And it also risks the trafficking victim themselves mm -hmm. um, from either being killed or going further into the, the dark, basically, mm -hmm. where you, you might not ever find them again. So, um, after that, he marches his way to the city. There's literally an image of him just stomping his way to the city or stomping his way to his truck. But the next scene, we finally see, supposedly, who the titular she was. Oh, don't forget, you... it's got the headline, moving to somewhere you wouldn't want to be. <laughs> That's what I was just about to bring up. And I said, clearly. So we finally <laughs> see, I don't want to be here anymore. <laughs> I said glowing blonde in yoga pants. Ah, <laughs> that was what I, uh, I said, like, this is uh, the titular she that was referred to two weeks later prior to Avery entering the city. And we're met with a standoff between the cops and this blonde headed woman in yoga pants. I said the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Why would she show up again in yoga pants? Like, if, you think if she's, if she's going to make a grand entrance, she would be dressed up for something. Not like she just came from spin class. <laughs> I feel like maybe she must have been jogging or something because she comments on the fact that you didn't think I would notice you not following me or something like that. So I'm just like, you're clearly not wanted in the city, Yaya, whatever your name is. <laughs> Yara. So, <laughs> Yara. I don't know. I, keep, I just kept calling her Yaya because it made <laughs> me giggle. Um, so I'm like, you're clearly not wanted here. I don't know what you did two weeks ago, because I'm only going to assume that you are the woman that these cops were referring to at the very beginning of this comic. But the yeah, crazy thing is... you've also got Alpha Core at that in that scene saying you were yeah. told not to come back. So that's the assumption that this is who was yeah, in the prologue. Yeah, assumption. So what happened two weeks earlier and what's the significance of it? We don't know. Because or what was she doing for two whole weeks? And also, yeah, how did this city not prepare? They knew that she was coming. They yeah. knew that she's obviously a destructive force because you got freaking cops over here with their little pellet guns trying to stop her. Yeah, like, and it's If they working. dealt with this woman before, then you wouldn't have just normal cops attacking her. You would have them barricading mm -hmm. the area and trying yeah. to get people away while you wait for the other superheroes oh, yeah. to come in to fight her. You wouldn't be yeah. having basically civilian cops attacking a superhero. <laughs> Not at all. That's why Alpha Corps got con called in, I'm assuming. But even then, she whoops their asses like they they were nothing. But also, like, they you have, like, would you not have, would the cops have, with the governor, not the governor, that police chief that was like, oh no, she's coming in two weeks. Would he not have called Alpha Corps like immediately to be like, bro, she's coming back. We need you to just like no. watch the city and make sure that if you see her, do not let her get into the middle of the city. You know what I found really funny was at the beginning, the, the the woman, I think, was like, oh, you told me to keep this under wraps. And I'm like, okay, if a dangerous person has re-entered the city that could possibly level the city, don't you think the cops need to know, mm -hmm. being on a need-to-know basis with this type of person and yep. the Alpha Corps needs to be called? And so I don't understand why this needs to be under wraps because it's not about to be under wraps for very long. Everyone's going to know when she comes into the freaking... Building, she glows right? in the dark, guys. She glows she in the dark. She gonna <laughs> She's in yoga pants. She got a sweatband around her head. She is ready to work out and rumble with this city. I think it's time to evacuate. But Alpha Core shows up, which there is no significance to this scene. 
There no. really isn't. It's just showing us that Yara, uh, Yara or whatever her name is. I, I'm going to say Yara like you, but I think Yay is funnier. But... <laughs> so I'll I mean, she... Yaya goes with pro Jesus. So you know. I know Yaya pro Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're that we we're given their names, but literally this is I think the first and the last time that we see Alpha Core, and then it skips to. Darren, half a mile away from the destruction, <laughs> no, by the no, way. Avery, 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 half a mile away. Okay, you know what? Darren and Avery are cut from the same cloth, as That's far as I'm concerned. They're the same person, because they both overreact to literally everything. <laughs> Darren, or not Darren, Avery asks Darren if he's seen Jasmine, and then Darren flips out about it. So he's still snitching on himself anyway. <laughs> We'll get yeah, there. let's Sorry. we'll get there. So Avery is half a mile away from all of these guns going off, by the way. <laughs> and there is no like panic in the street. Everything is business as usual. Freaking half yeah. a mile away. Bro, that's a 30 minute walk if you're going 20 minute walk if right you're now. going slow. <laughs> yes, it is. Like half a mile is not that far. I've heard cars backfiring two miles away from my house. I think people would be able to hear gunshots and people screaming at that distance. And, yeah. and you're looking at- They would at be evacuating the area. They would be, and yet people are behind like police tape lines and stuff like that. And just like, you guys are really shitty at protecting your city. <laughs> like how has the crime decreased by 12%? Like, <laughs> So he's, Avery is half a mile away at this club called Club Merc. It's a club owned by Darren, who we will learn is an old school buddy of Avery, Avery's. which is why his sister called to send him because she's like, hey, you guys were friendly in high school. Would you go mm -hmm. talk to him to see if he knows what happened to Jasmine? Yeah. Now, Avery walks up and he's talking to the bouncers outside of the club and he's like, hey, I know Darren. Will you let me in? I want to talk to him. And the bouncers uh -huh. are like, uh, Darren didn't tell us you were coming. You're not allowed to go in. And fortunately enough for Avery, since everything seems to fall into his lap, Darren yeah. just comes out and he's like, hey, buddy, hey, why man. don't you come inside? <laughs> like he got their gym and he quit, dude. Like he, he Which, got Whatever, their they path. have cameras. Yeah. I'm sure he has cameras. Yeah, I'm sure. But, I thought that was great. But, he should also, like, that's a fine entrance to make, but then he should also have been prepared for whatever he thinks Avery was, Avery was about to ask for. Mm -hmm. But he takes Avery inside, and then Avery's like, so I'm looking for this girl named Jasmine. And, Mer <laughs> and, uh, and Aaron's like, excuse me? What does <laughs> I have to do with that? You're going to look like a cop? I also want to note here that um, Avery says it's been uh, it has been a minute, Mr. Silman. You can't be doing that well if I don't know what you're up to. Looking for some work. So this is literally one of the first. Um, what is the start of Darren making snide remarks to Avery about his employment status? And trust me, this is probably the most significant thing about what happens at all in this story because. Uh, <clears throat> It's literally what drives Avery is how freaking Darren insults him. <laughs> He's not going to stand Which for that, it. I think if that had happened later when he confronts him later mm -hmm. or he beats him later because Avery had obviously challenged him and then he gets mm -hmm. beat and then Darren mocks him because obviously Avery has been laid out. Mm -hmm. And so then he could be like, who do you think you are, Avery? I have an empire in this city. yeah and what are you nobody knows who you are you ran away to go and live in a barn with cows like then avery could have been like oh this man disrespect me i'm gonna whoop some ash but he doesn't wait well, to build up that tension no he doesn't but i don't even think darren knows if avery is where avery is because he has no idea like i said since Darren has no idea uh, uh, Avery is working a farm, he must not know Avery isn't living in the city anymore because he mm. doesn't have eyes on Avery. So I don't even think Darren actually knows if Avery is in the city. That's why he asked if he's looking for work, which, you know, he could be lying about, but I kind of don't think he is because Darren doesn't seem to be that smart. You um, know, that would have <laughs> been an interesting angle for this to take if Avery had gone in. Mm -hmm. And then after Darren was like, are you looking for work? Avery was like, yes. Because there he you wanted go. to get some information and he wanted to spy on Darren. And Darren was obviously being a cloister and wasn't just going to trust him with information. Yeah. But, you and know, clearly, that didn't have to happen because no. Darren is just an open book about everything. Like, oh, oh my God, I haven't, I haven't seen this guy since high school. But, well, you know, Darren and this guy walks in, obviously already talking about the missing girl. And Darren is offended that this guy is asking about the missing girl. But still, <laughs> Darren takes Avery to a back room where he just spills his guts about 
their lives <laughs> since then. And he's like, oh, I built did. an empire. Some of it legally, some of it not so legally. Bro, were you just not just angry that this guy might be acting like a cop? What are he, you doing? Like, he basically freaking says he has Jasmine without saying he has he Jasmine. He narked on himself. He, no, he saw his he snuff he self snitched on himself. Like I you was know, sitting there, like I can't believe you were this exaggerated. This is such a mustache twirling villain exact moment quote right here. here is, <laughs> when people like me go away like that, we're usually dead or in jail. Yet I built myself an empire. Some of it the legal way. Some of it not much, not so much, but an empire nonetheless. Lovely young ladies like Jasmine are useful to me, and that that the junction of my career. Unless you're trying to mop my kitchen floors, you are not <laughs> he knows that avery came in to go after him so there is no reason for him to spill this other than lazy writing on the author's part in order to make things fall out mm -hmm. so avery doesn't have to do any work at all yeah and i said so instead of getting any like interesting information he just makes avery sit there and listen to him go on about how avery was par for the course in high school and didn't amount to anything even if he had both his parents which i thought was like a very interesting line uh which there's a there's a statistic there's a certain group of people out there who like to say if you don't have both your parents then you're going to be set up for a, as a failure in life but that being said uh, it's basically this spiel Danny DeVito gives Mara Wilson's character in Matilda. I'm smart, you're dumb. I'm big, you're little. I'm right, you're wrong, and there's nothing you can do about it. Oh yeah, Darren? So this conversation really is nothing special, and the only purpose it serves is to get Angry's, uh, Avery's blood boiling. And he might as well be called Angry, because that's what <laughs> he steady stays being in this book, is Angry, because he got dissed by yeah, Darren. He's <laughs> He starts out at angry because he gets called into the city and he hates the city. And then he's just mm -hmm. irate the whole rest of the book. Oh, he's so irate the whole <laughs> rest of the book. And this is where the freaking shit pops off and hits the fan, man. Yep. So he gets <laughs> mad at this guy and then fight initiates. And he's like, I'm going to fight you. And Darren is like, uh-uh, you in my turf. So he's got all of these henchies that come out of nowhere to kick uh -huh. Avery's butt. And he gets kicked out of the building. This he is... gets thrown out of the building. No, he got thrown half a mile away by that big black <laughs> guy. <laughs> That's what happened. <laughs> That's why he's telling me he just did a clear straight shot of throwing him half a mile away. Yes. But we still couldn't hear the police bullets from Avery getting there. No! He, and he fucking runs in the... After this, he runs as like, uh, I think Darren, like he asked Darren, oh, so you're hiring um, accepts now? Because this dude is like hulking big. And also he has yellow teeth. So I don't think he brushes. I don't know if you noticed that with the or armor. Or it's a grill. This, or it's a grill. Okay, that's fair. Um, so, oh, actually, you know what? I think it is a grill. It's a grill. I was like, <laughs> um, but no, Avery gets his ass kicked and then he goes, get up out of here and tossed out the building. <laughs> and I think he got thrown half a mile away because he runs, literally gets thrown into Ye uh, Yara. And I figured where... that Yara and the street fight just moved out in front of Club Merc. No, I, I don't I don't want to believe that at all. I want to believe he got thrown <laughs> half a mile away. That's hilarious. <laughs> I, know, like, I noticed that too. <laughs> so uh, Avery gets his ass kicked and then gets thrown into another ass whooping. Super convenient. <laughs> so, yeah. Super he's convenient. He's just tossed. He's tossed. He's picked up by her and like knocked around and then thrown into a car. And then she <laughs> flies off saying maybe this will like send the message to them. But like what message is that supposed to send she just grabs yeah. this random person she's been beating up on people for mm -hmm. who knows how long because she was already yeah. fighting cops before avery mm -hmm. got there and then yep. she just picks up another random person and, throws and alpha core she was already fighting alpha core so like yeah. what is the message that's being sent by beating up on avery specifically he said she asked him why are you dressed like you're an undercover cop or something and avery's like undercover that idiot thinks this is a sting and it's like Okay, so clearly the cops have probably been chasing her this whole time, but I find it hilarious that she's in jogging outfit, like a jogging outfit, just tra la lolling in the city when she's not wanted there. That's the only thing I'm going to assume. But she comments on the fact, you know, like, if you're not a c undercover, then why are you so strong? Because Avery, I guess, his superpower is that he is really, really strong. Because we find out later, when Yara picks him up, that... 
out of all the things that he could have done, the one of the things he can't do is fly, and he promptly crash lands on a car, and it breaks his fall. That is really, that was so fucking funny. And that's the end of that. So then we go <laughs> back to the country where Avery's coworker is talking mm. to someone who came for supplies, and they praise mm -hmm. how Avery is the most ambitious person they've ever met. Well, he literally <laughs> shows none of that at all, except for when he's trying to get back at Darren. So this, like, <laughs> this is a sign of a power fantasy or a self insert, or in some mm -hmm. cases, a Gary Sue, is that every character compulsively has to compliment, compliment that character. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we would have seen him being ambitious if we got a moment at the beginning of the book where he was actually working on the farm. <laughs> I know, like, and we don't, and also this, this whole scene on the farm, there's two scenes where we run into the farm, we go back to the farm, which I feel are so pointless and shouldn't have been interwoven throughout. I feel like they should have been at the end, but I'll save my thoughts for why that could be later. But also I don't really, I'll get, we'll get there, but I don't really see it, it, it necessary because all it does is it's just talking about how Avery's this hardworking, ambitious guy, which we don't see him do. We don't see him working on his farm. We see him working out by himself, not really doing anything, bitching about how he's got to go into the city, and then bitching about how he got dissed by Darren, gets his ass kicked and thrown out, blah, blah, blah. And then we go back to the farm, and I'm just like, why is this so significant? I don't know, because it holds no bearing on the story either. Yep. Um, and <laughs> you just get the compliment and then they close the shop and Jim asks the kids if they want to stay late so that they can get more work done because they're obviously short staffed since Avery's not there. And one kid is like, I need to go back to the city so I can watch the game. And then another kid is like, I'll stay behind. And so then Jim is like, bruh, I appreciate your work ethic. We're going to need to train somebody else at this rate because the boss is going to need to be replaced. But like, we're going to need, why to are they the replacing the boss with a teenager? It's like, isn't that his farm? Like, isn't that Avery's farm? Like this scene is so retardedly dramatic. Like even Jim's face is so like, <laughs> we're going to need to replace our boss. Like what happened? Like, but Avery's not back all of a sudden, so that means he's dead. Like, if he's hardworking and ambitious and you see how big the guy is, you would think he'd be able to take care of himself in the city. But, I mean, kind of can't because everything that happens in the city is kind of <laughs> not really great to Avery. Um, so that's the end of that scene. And then the next scene, we are at the hospital. Wait, wait, wait. I got it. Uh-huh. <laughs> 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 We're going to need to replace him. <laughs> <laughs> Look at how serious his face is. Like, I, 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 I'm gonna need to replace him. <laughs> this is so dramatic. Like, you don't even know what's going on. Like, he uh, could be held up doing something. You know, maybe assume that you're he's seeing his sister, unless the farmers don't know he has family. But I would think that maybe even Altana bringing Vassy out, which that's the name of his niece, by the way, is Vassy. Could be short for something. I don't know, but. Could have taken her out to visit or something. Kids like going to farms. You'd you know, they should, so, especially if there's animals. So after the scene at the farm, then we're at the hospital where Avery has been admitted because obviously he was mm -hmm. body slammed onto a mm -hmm. car. Uh, and so the people are talking about how there are no records on him. There is no identification. They don't know who he is. And then they go back to the room and he's not there. He that also mentions out. that he has like an ankle bracelet that they couldn't cut off of him. So I don't know what that's for because he also has one on his wrist. And I thought, well, maybe that's just something that could maybe be a locator. But I think that's the bracelet because he uses it to ping his sister. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what the ankle bracelet's for either. I mean, I don't have to know, but I feel like there is need to know information that's not going to kill the big things in the story that the audience should know. Like, why is he wearing this ankle thing? Is it to keep track of him? Is I he being monitored? I like, didn't mind not knowing about the ankle bracelet because I feel like that's going to have to come in. That's going to come in later. That has to do with, like, the agreement he made so that he was not a government superhero. Right, like yeah. Door. Like, if they're like, That's oh, you I have thought. superpowers, so you're going to either be working for us or you're going to be regulated with this thing so we can track you. Mm -hmm. That's what I assume, so I don't need answers yeah. on that right now. That's fair, because, like, I was, I think I mentioned to you, too, uh, uh, like, a couple, like, a day or two ago about how, like, 
Uh, clearly, I think what happened was that there was probably these superheroes. I think the reason why crime decreased by 12% is because they got rid of all the independently working accepts who were <laughs> damaging property and injuring civvies and stuff like that. Because those are technically crimes, right? But you know, so then that would mean that the big mm -hmm. guy that's working for Darren has to either be unknown to the government or he's also got a monitor. Yeah, and I, I think would think then so. that if they had monitors like that, then the government would be watching to make sure that they are not basically selling out their abilities to be mercs for criminal. Yeah, or, exactly. So I'm just like, okay, so why would Darren have one? But honestly, that's just something that could be explained later on. That's actually a good, I would say, intriguing. Like, oh, why does he have that thing? It doesn't yeah. need to be explained right away. I just remember seeing that. But he also has one on his wrist, which I'm going to assume that's just whatever maybe some gps locator thing but who knows yeah. so um <laughs> so after he leaves the hospital he's obviously pinged his sister with a gps mm -hmm. thing that is on his bracelet she comes to pick him up and he says take me to the nearest car lot because i assume that's where my car is that's mm -hmm. not always how it works i've heard people's cars get picked up and they go like 30 minutes away but that's just mm -hmm. obvious convenience for this so he yeah. gets He's got a change of clothes in there. So he just goes there, changes clothes. And his sister is like, what happened to you? She tells him that he got beat up by this powerful chick. And she's like, okay, I'm going to call the law now because. Uh, oh my God. This whole scene was ridiculous Darren. to me. Oh my gosh. Like, um, oh, I yeah, said, he, like, well, he also says, he goes, so I got beat up. And also I ran into Darren and discovered what's going on with him. Please don't tell mama. Don't yeah. Tell he mama don't tell mom about it. Don't tell mom about what happened, bro. Like, oh my gosh, like, I just, um, I also find it really interesting because, like, I said, was like, okay, so his sister eventually shows up after she's been pinged, and I'm guessing it's from the wrist, but that doesn't really matter. They talk about what happened, and Avery says he really didn't understand what happened to him for some reason. He doesn't tell his sister he got his ass whipped really big by the muscle-bound dude and the Viking bitch. <laughs> That's what I said. Um, but he tells her that Darren does have Jasmine and that there is something to what is happening to her. Um, perhaps he's he also like, like, I'm angry now. I'm going to go beat up Darren. Yes. And it's so funny because as that's happening, she goes, if you don't update me uh, or uh, every other hour, I'm going to tell mom. And he goes, sis, you know, I can handle myself. I'll give you more details later. Just let me get my ride, a new set of clothes and regroup. And then in the blur below that, it says, truth be told, saving Jasmine wasn't my primary focus. I almost forgot about it. That clown talked down to me and that won't go unaddressed. So literally he's not doing this for anybody else but himself because Darren dissed him. Which by the way, Avery started that fight. Yes, he was, did. He did. He started the fight. He has, he has been steady starting these fights on his own. It's like you could have walked away from that and then regroup because like a man that's actually a self-respecting man is not going to let some pimp trash like that talk to him and it means something to him because it's clearly just Darren trying to rile him up, which yep. it worked. And it's funny because he later goes on to say that he has kind of always been this way, Avery. So maybe that could be a connection between him and Darren, that Darren knows that Avery's hot tempered mm -hmm. and he's impulsive. And so he knows how to get under his skin. So maybe that is, you know, could be something along the lines of that. But I kind of get this feeling that it's not. I feel like Darren or not Darren, Avery. Da Oops. I mean, Avery, excuse me, because they're basically the same person. Um, <clears throat> Darren. Avery. Avery just like screw trafficked women. I'm offended. I'm offended. That's exactly what this <laughs> is. He's offended because he got told that he was not doing shit. And it's like, dude, Avery, you have a fucking working farm and he's a lot a of money. He's not a secure man. But he's, he's not, not a, a secure, secure man. man. Because if he was a secure man and he was learning anything about being in the farm where you would think that maybe if he did have anger issues before, that uh -huh. he would be working on his character development out at the farm. And like maybe yeah. the story, he'll work on that character development. We'll see in the future. But you would think that it would be one of those things he'd focus on of, I don't want to be so angry because in high school, I got into a lot of fights. Could be a thing. Yeah. And so then... This could be Darren poking the bear over and over and over again until he yeah. got that response because he mm -hmm. said what was a weakness to Avery, yeah. which is he is not a secure man. He pretends to be a secure man. You would think that he he would be secure because he runs the successful farm, but yeah. he's not or a secure Jim man. This it. is enough that makes him so angry.
Yeah, exactly. It's like literally like you have no idea when you're literally poking the bear, Avery, because this is clearly a man who has a lot of power. If he's able to traffic women like that and has this huge club, which, by the way, is referred to as being like the spot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I found that to be very uh, interesting because it's like, you know, you are potentially putting your family in jeopardy here, especially since Darren knows you guys. Which is also something that his sister should have told him about Darren mm -hmm. by being like, yeah. oh, yeah, so your old friend from high school, Darren, we I think that he might have something to do with Jasmine's disappearance. By the way, he runs a good portion of the city. He's an entrepreneur. He's the owner of the biggest club in town. Uh -huh. that spot. Like she should have told him all of that stuff to prepare exactly. him for going in. And then Avery could have entered the situation being like, hey, Darren, you've done really good for yourself since high school. This is incredible. And so then they could have had like a little chummy thing that was then just peppered with Darren being uh, like with backhanded compliments. Yeah, like backhanded. Because he hasn't you know, heard yeah. anything about Avery. And so then he Avery. could have assumed <laughs> that Avery was in jail because he talks about that in their little one-on-one -on -one meeting. So he could have been like, oh, I hadn't heard from you. I thought you got arrested for some BS because obviously, and then you could make some references to the troublemaker that Avery was in high school. Like yeah. there's so much that you could have done here with that interaction that could have had Darren sort of probing mm -hmm. Avery that would yeah. both expose their relationship, who they were in the past and what their dynamic is now. Absolutely. I would agree with that because it's like it's only really gone to show that Avery is <laughs> impulsive. He's he's hot tempered. He does not think before he acts. His critical thinking skills are just world class, you know, and mm -hmm. he doesn't seem he has like almost this very roguish devil may care attitude about anything he's doing in the city. And I feel like it's like, dude, you're not actually really trying to solve an issue here. It's not all these people making these problems for you you're making them for yourself with these people you didn't have to act the way that you did and you probably again like i said really probably endangered your sister's family endangered mrs newman because if you didn't notice he tried everything in his power to keep his name out of the jasmine equation when he was talking to darren initially and throws mrs newman's name under the bus well mrs newman's looking for her, so now you've potentially gotten mrs newman in trouble with these people so mm -hmm. like you're endangering everybody in this very selfish way that i'm just like wow like how am i supposed to root for somebody like this yeah. i'm not saying that you have to have this like really morally superior like altruistic type character but you have to be able to empathize with him to some degree in order to root for him and i just can't get behind it i really can't i couldn't mm -hmm. so then um, avery <laughs> after all of this uh and with the talking to the kid about staying behind and thanking him for helping on the farm avery calls jim and tells him that he's gonna go after darren he might be gone in the city for a couple of days and he'll call if he needs him jim then goes and grabs his gun i found the scene to be hilarious oh. because it was just more talk about um how farm life people get shunned and stuff like that i'm like why why are we talking about this what does this what does this do but you're right as he's on the phone like it's just reiterating what we already know mm -hmm. all right i don't know why jim needs to know he could have called jim we could have just seen avery say hey yeah i'm still in the city i'll be back later and then we not have to cut to the scene with jim on the farm coming into what looks like there's somebody in one of the buildings so he pulls out his gun and what happens next well we don't know because it changes the scene and and also on that we have to then assume because he says hey i'm going after darren and so then the dude goes and poses with his gun gets his gun in preparation which means jim knows about darren yeah so then why didn't avery approach Darren, one, with any level of grace or mm -hmm. carefulness. But two, now we have to assume that Avery already knew that Darren was criminal and told Jim before he went to pick up the girl. We didn't see that scene. So we just have no. to assume that Jim has that information, that Avery and Jim have had that conversation before. Exactly. Even, but even when Avery was talking to his sister on the phone, she didn't mention his criminal enterprises. No, so she was, didn't. Not at all. So I don't think Jim actually really knows about any of this. I don't even really think that Jim knows who Darren is. And also, Darren doesn't even know that Avery is working on a farm. He doesn't know what he's doing. So I don't know what the point of this scene is. I don't know if, if Jim is walking into some sort of trap that was set up by Darren. But Darren doesn't seem to know if Avery is 
doing anything. That's why he wonders about his employment in a very snide way. Yep. And so and if this, he knew about the farm, then he needed to give some sort of comment that implicated he knew about the farm. Yeah. And he didn't. He just said, oh, well, I hadn't heard from you and only God knows how long. And I guess you must not be doing anything. Care to work in the kitchen? Yeah, it's really freaking trashy for him to say something like that. But it just tells me that Avery, not Avery, Darren, <laughs> Darren doesn't know that Avery's living on a farm. So this whole scene with Jim is fucking pointless. The other scene with old McDonald was also pointless too. So, well, And let's see if they moved this to the end. After That's Darren had already too. started doing research on Avery to see where he's been and discovered the farm, mm -hmm. then that could have shown the difference between the beginning interaction where they haven't spoken in years and mm -hmm. then where he is now. And that Darren has something against Avery, so he's going to go after him on a personal level. Yes, which would but be an instead, attack the farm. But instead, this is skipping, sharing information, and then re re um, relying on the reader assuming that people know everything, like that mm -hmm. characters are sharing information and that the characters have the same information that we have. But we have mm -hmm. no reason to believe that Jim knows about Darren, that Darren knows about Jim, that his sister, when we saw the phone call scene, that she said anything about criminality beyond, I think that he might have Jasmine. He's just, or like he's trouble or something like that. You know yeah. that Darren's trouble. That's it. And that's so like basic. But then he shows up at Club Murr Merc or whatever you want to call it. So it seems like they know Darren is in some way wealthy now and runs this club. If, if you know, Avery knew where to go to find him. So clearly, if the question is, does Avery know that Darren is just this dangerous? Mm -hmm. Or does he not know? Because it seems like it's very convenient that he would know how to find Darren. Mm-hmm. Because I don't know if, if Altana mentioned that Darren was working a club downtown. Uh, all I remember her saying was that, oh, I think she's fallen in with Darren and you know he's trouble or something like that. So mm -hmm. they probably know a little bit about Darren, but that just goes to show you how fucking stupid Avery is for going in and behaving the way he's doing. Because that is really putting everyone in danger. Oh, well, And I think if the sister knew about Darren, then there should have been more specific language in that first phone call scene because mm -hmm. you don't need to hide that information from the reader. You're setting the stakes. So if you're purposefully as the writer hiding mm -hmm. things from the reader to make it mysterious, you're actually not building the stakes or the mystery or getting the reader invested because you're oh, not one, not one bit blurred so that the reader doesn't know with the hopes that they'll go, oh, what is this? But if you actually exactly. have these characters in this situation go, hey, by the way, Darren has sort of gotten in the in kind of the criminal crowd and I think he's kind of dangerous and Jasmine has fallen in with him. Now you're invested because you know that Jasmine may very well be in danger and they have used specific language. Yes, exactly. Not only that, but I feel like there should be more of a connection to Jasmine too, because if, if Mrs. Newman never missed a Sunday service, then that would imply that Jasmine also probably never missed a Sunday service growing up. And if Avery knew that about his mom and their family, then I would think that there was to be some form of childhood connection between these three people. Something. But I something other than just I don't want my mama to bust my ass, so I'm just I better go and do this. Yep. Um, but th this whole farm scene really is is pointless. I don't like again if we were gonna have any of the farm scenes or what was happening back on the farm. Um, I feel like it should have been at the very end because it would go in tandem with what Darren was saying at the very end of this comic after Avery. Uh, or before Avery gets his suit, but um, I think I, we'll get there. But. I also think that it would have done a, a good job to bookend this if one, you take out the the precinct chapter and you open this mm -hmm. with Avery at his farm, working on his farm, showing the family and the community at his farm. Mm -hmm. and, and then also, at the end, yeah. you then have the Darren threatening, the Darren conversation that we'll get to. And then yeah. it ends with Jim preparing the way that he is. Yes, because exactly. that farm is important because you've built it opening with the importance of this farm and the family mm -hmm. of this farm and you're ending with the protection and the, of the meaningfulness of this farm. Yes, exactly. Because if Darren or not Darren Avery, <laughs> I can't help it. I'm sorry. You're good. <laughs> um, but it, it, I feel like it would have been interesting to see them actually, like you said, when working on this farm, the dynamic of the farm with the family that he's built. And if, and if Avery can't seem to find 
a kinship or a family with his own blood, then it would really be nice to see a family and friendship and sort of this not really blood related, but it still feels closer than the family that I grew up with kind of mentality mm -hmm. going on here, which might make sense as to why he wouldn't want to help his sister because maybe he's not very close with his sister. But then and they so seem very close with the car scene and then when he goes to yeah. her house. Yeah, exactly. I'm just like, I really don't know the character dynamics all that well because they're not expressed. In fact, every character in this book is so surface level and extra and emotional, but there's nothing beneath any of that. There's no mm -hmm. real depth to, of character here. It's all very you know, paint by numbers, basic rogue stereotype character who has a sister that's looking out for him. The cops are in trouble. There's something else going on. There's this very hokey um, uh, mustache twirling, big fat stogie between his fingers villain who is monologuing at him telling him all these stupid things that really I don't know why he did in the first place because it makes no sense. It's just him trying to insult Avery. Like all Darren had to do was say, I don't have her. I don't know what, I don't know what you're talking about. But instead he basically says he has Jasmine without saying he has Jasmine. He self snitched on himself. Yep. And so does Avery just yep. internally. Like they both self snitch on themselves. I'm just like, what the hell guys like have a modicum of intelligence here. I don't care if you may be these types of people, but at least be smart about it. That's all I'm asking. <laughs> like, yeah. So getting but, back to the story, uh -huh. Avery is just sitting in his car in the street <laughs> in front of Club Merc being like, what should I do? He's do you like, think... you've been sitting here for hours pondering, wondering what, <laughs> what he should do. What next thing should be. So, so then Avery is asked by some guy right outside Club. Oh, then some guy is walking by him as he's sitting outside and actually approaches his car. And he's like, bro, do you need help? And Avery's like, nah, I'm just... I'm just thinking about this club. Do you know anything about Club Merc? And so the guy is like, well. And you look at the guy and he's like, do you really think this man would know anything about Club Merc? Because I mean, he looks the guy, like about. <laughs> the guy is like, that's the place to be. Like, it's super uh -huh. rich people yeah. in there. Um, Avery still acts dumb when there are implications that prostitution and human trafficking happen in there. One, when we get to whatever his past uh -huh. is, if he used to work for the government of some kind and then he walked away. Mm -hmm. or whatever he came from as a superhero style person that had that suit. How yeah. would he not understand the language of trafficking and prostitution too? Darren already yeah. said this kind of girl helps me in the junction of life that I'm in. Three, Darren has said that he's involved in criminal activity. How can Avery still be like ignorant of whether trafficking- I know, especially if you're, if you're bringing up that type of thing going on, then they would absolutely know that this is sort of, some, this is something that happens in the city. This is the underbelly of the city. And not mm -hmm. only that, but like Darren comments, not Darren, Avery comments. <laughs> I'm not a detective. I really, I could really jack this up and I'm probably thinking this, taking this too personal. Yes, you are. You are taking it way too personal and you've already jacked it up, Avery. You That's, done fucked up, dude. See, and see how much, more endearing also that Avery could have been if he was getting involved with this and human trafficking was mentioned and Darren knew that Avery was starting to challenge him in that room or wherever they might have run into mm -hmm. each other and then Darren's like don't you have a sister and a niece I heard you had a niece Avery this man is involved in human trafficking what does a comment yeah. like that imply Oh yeah, that's a threat. That's a veiled threat right there. That's absolutely something that's like like it's I I don't know why this 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 comic is like giving us like really heavy topics like human trafficking, sex trafficking, uh, the under seedy underbelly of like this this city. So Avery is kind of just making more trouble for himself and then making more trouble for his family. I've said this a bunch of times and then it, I find it really weird when he has these interactions with civilians that it seems so cordial and um, there's always a handshake at the end of every like interaction he has with these really nice people um and i find it really funny that uh he goes jasmine could be darren's assistant she could be doing other kind of work um i'm actually fake concerned i really just want to punch him in, the, him in him in his mouth so he still doesn't care about what's happening with jasmine no and he it just, just <laughs> hurts anything with caring about him and i was like dude like 
like you were disrespected like come on people get disrespected it doesn't mean you go and you beat the crap out of somebody especially someone like darren i wouldn't the even mind he if he just had a harmed ego from that if he just yeah. wasn't so self-centered that he's like i don't freaking care about jasmine being trafficked <laughs> it was like um like darren's arrogant enough to write me off or is he i'm just like what does that mean I got confused by that bit, and maybe you have a better explanation as to why he could have said something like that, but I was finding it interesting with his internal monologuing uh, that we see Darren talk about. Um, I also find it really funny that Darren is basically in a dressed-down version of the clothes he had on before he was in the hospital, because I realized at first I thought he was in the same clothes he'd come, he'd come in. I thought, wait a minute, wouldn't those clothes that he got beat the crap beat the crap out of in be in like a hospital bag somewhere? But then I realized like, oh, he was in a button-down shirt with some pat pants on, and now he's in a red hoodie with the same colored pants on. So I just thought that that was funny. He's in like the same looking clothes. Um, so but, mm -hmm. now we're skipping forward after he's just had this conversation with this oh, guy, God. told more about the prostitution. And we skip to some random superpower people sitting in the club, judging the city and deciding that they need to think on the scale of things that they want. This is a I... whole nother plot thread with random characters being introduced in three to four pages with zero grounding in anything that's going on. And it ends up making the whole book read directionless and confusing because these people never come back. I understand attempting to try to introduce multiple plot strings, but you haven't even grounded us in Darren and Avery. But yeah, I saw this scene. I was like, who the f are these people? I don't care. I don't care. Especially if there's no relevance to what they're doing. And I remember Darren mentioning that there was some money maker happening on tonight, but these people don't seem like they're in it for Darren. Like this one girl wants to sort of like potentially buy out this club for whatever reason, because there's some sort of knowledge base that she could get her hands on. They're both two accepts, which is what our superheroes refer to here, or mutants, whatever you want to call them. Um, they're basically the same thing. And they're sitting here having this private conversation with a bouncer outside, no less. So I really don't understand the point of this scene between them or why they've been introduced. If these people were going to be introduced, I feel like they should have been introduced in the second issue or after the third issue. or the third issue, because there's really no point. It's only two pages long. And then after that, we're back to Avery. <laughs> if you separated this and made the first book, the introduction to Avery, Jasmine, Darren, and this whole underbelly of things going on. Then the second book introduces Yara with the police call cop or with the cop call saying she's coming back. And so then you run into Yara while Avery is running around, both trying to get information on Darren and trying to avoid Darren while Darren is attacking the farm. Then that gives an introduction to Yara, a continuation of the tension from the first book and the mystery of the first book as mm -hmm. Avery has to work for his answers. And yes. then the third book could have had the introduction of these characters as the prologue for that, because then the book could have focused on how these characters also have influence in the city and mm -hmm. how they're working with Darren and then mer merged those in so that mm -hmm. they were relevant because as it is now introducing this halfway through the book and then they're never again is not enough to justify breaking up the plot for this yeah there's no, there's not enough to justify breaking up the plot with that because it even even if I don't like the farm scenes there is a place for those farm scenes there just don't need to be in between the main story I feel like again I said this they should have been at the end after Darren talks about what he's planning to do because mm -hmm. essentially he puts out a hit on Avery and um so I feel like that should have been at the end of that because that sets up the stakes if he we had seen um, Darren, like you'd mentioned, Avery on his farm, like you had mentioned, working his farm, working with his colleagues, working with the people that he considers his family, and then having to be pulled away from that, away from deadlines or business or whatever this could interfere. This could have really been a big deal if he wasn't there to help because he's very proactive, he's hands-on, mm -hmm. he's not somebody that like hides in the shadows or he's like sits at the top and watches everybody else work. I do get the feeling that that's not the type of character Eric July wanted to create, but more a character that is proactive with the people that he cares about. But we don't really see that because if he had endeared us with the farm bits at the beginning and we'd actually seen Avery 
care about his farm, then the scene at the end with the with Jim and the others have possibly being under siege from somebody who's been hired by Darren to interfere with them, that would have made us be like, uh oh, what's going to happen to these characters? Yep. But we don't really get that. And, and if he I, was, and if EG, and if um, Avery was supposed to be created as an ambitious character. Mm -hmm. And then having other people compliment Avery on his ambitions, that wasn't shown through the choice of having Avery opened up by working out by himself. No, no. Well, it just his goes other to people were working because then he went to go and tell Jim, BT dubs, I'm going to go to the city while Jim was doing work. Yep. Absolutely. That That's all I saw from that. I'm just like, I remember reading through this the second time. I'm like, this is why I need to do like a second read through of stuff because I really pick up on more when I read a second time. Mm -hmm. um but um comics a little easier to do a second read through on than a, a book itself but <laughs> maybe depend on the book however like um what i was gonna say was like he really is established as a rogue mm -hmm. that he is a devil may care type bad uh, character um i don't know how he ended up having a farm but like, maybe if he did you were mentioning earlier you know had a hot temper because it does state that he's always been this way actually we're fixing to come up on that where he says you know i don't know the um I don't know if this is ill advised, but I've oh, but this has always been me. That's what he says. So this has always been me, and so I'm guessing, assuming that he's always been impulsive and has a temper. Mm -hmm. um, but if he's working on the farm to help correct that, because when you give a man direction and you give him something to do, that course corrects his temper, and he can't just, you know, blow his way through things with a fist and a, a kit. And he has to really kind of solve things through the mind. Um, I feel like that could have, again, played into what would happen later if he's like, oh, yeah, like maybe I could get a job here just to see what's going on. I think maybe also mm -hmm. if it was established, obviously it's said in the text, and if it had consequences in the buildup, like with Darren constantly poking Avery until he got the reaction that he wanted because he mm -hmm. lost his anger and then that yeah. got his butt beat then later that could actually have contributed to the change in Avery that allows him to beat the big guy because he was able to keep his anger Under control so yeah. that he could think and being able to think and strategize and not just act out impulsively is what yeah. allowed him to win against the big guy. It's like what Jordan Peterson says, assume the composition, you'll be able to think better that way. Yeah. And so I think that that could have really been a great way to go. That also could have won humbled Avery because he got his butt beat because he couldn't keep it under control and he had to work with himself to not yeah. fall into old patterns. Yeah, exactly. It's like it didn't take a lot to set him off. It really mm -hmm. didn't. And he has been steady pissed off this whole entire time from the time we meet him to the time we are right now he is in a bad mood and it's only going to get worse and he goes back to club Murr to start some fucking trouble yep. so. so back at club Murr in a hoodie he's walking up looking a bit like a mugger thinking about how he doesn't have a, and it's it's important to say he looks like a mugger because this place is surrounded by like rich people and upper, he does look upper like echelon a mugger. people. <laughs> he's in a hoodie. <laughs> thinking, so he's thinking how he doesn't have a plan, but he is walking in. So again, the fact that he's like, I don't have a plan. I'm just angry and I won around two. He should have lost again. Like he, he really should not have won <laughs> until he got himself under control. But he's like, I got no plan. I'm just going to wander <laughs> around, see what freaking happens. Maybe oh my just gosh. Bust in. <laughs> this is what got me. When you, when you plan prepare, prep for the absolute worst, and when you don't have a plan, make it up along the way. That's what not having a plan means, Avery. We all know that. When you don't got a plan, you have to make it up along the way. There's nothing important or profound about what you're saying here. And I kind of get the feeling that that was meant to be some sort of profound statement. But, you know, I could be wrong. I, I just don't. I, just, I thought it was stupid. <laughs> it made me laugh. Fortunately, his no plan works out because he just runs right into Jasmine Literally, right outside. She's, she's walking down the stairs and out <laughs> to the public. So I guess Jasmine's okay. He, maybe. Asks, he asks her if she's there voluntarily. And then they're interrupted by a couple of bouncers. Jasmine immediately runs off and Avery gets pissed off at the bouncers putting their hands on him because disrespect. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, dis I made a comment about... Uh, this whole scene with Jasmine 
Okay. And I said, we run into Jasmine, the girl of the hour who looks very unhappy. Avery confronts her and comments on the fact that he wasn't expecting to run into her so easily. Uh, we know you probably wouldn't have cared if you got, um, what did I say? Um, well, we know you probably wouldn't have cared if you ran into her or not, because finding Jasmine has not been the objective this entire time, which it really hasn't. Finding Jasmine was just kind of like a, 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 a strike of good fortune for Avery. And she's just yeah. literally not in prison. She's just walking down the steps. About looks like she's about to leave. Yep. Um, and I said, again, it's about getting even with Dave, da um, Darren and his henchies. But he yep. does ask her, um, or he does tell her that her mother's worried and she seems to be uncomfortable with the fact knowing that her mother's worried about her. But um, he also says, I, you know, he's not going to judge her. He just wants to know if working for Darren is involuntary. But we don't get that answer. And I don't think that there's a reason to care much for Jasmine because literally it looks like Jasmine is fine because she's leaving the club on her own and people are protecting her unless she's just you know prosting she's hunting or fishing you know for a, a person on the street i mean I, don't she know. Could, I was gonna say she could be being sent off to do a prostitution job yeah darren has control over her in some other way like i'll hurt your mother if you don't listen or blah mm -hmm. blah blah so there are reasons why she could be being obedient and but yeah. also playing what looks like free so yeah. <laughs> now that he's being touched by these bouncers, <laughs> Avery beats them up and strong arms his way into the club because nobody can beat him now. He's threatening everyone that he runs into, including party goers, saying that he oh, will yeah, beat them up right. if they don't stay out of the way. <laughs> they got to clear out of there now or else he's going to get them bad, dude. Like, I, I was like, holy shit, the shit hit the fan. Yep, he's like, superior to all because his feelings were hurt when he was disgraced. So hashtag justified and jackassery. Justified and jackassery and bitchery because <laughs> this is a this is a bitch move. I'm sorry, but this is such a bitch move. He's making it known. He's not even trying to hide his freaking face. Like there's cameras everywhere all <laughs> over Club Mer. Like if you were really worried about, you know, your family in some way, which he's not, he's never shown to be worried, like not one second throughout this entire thing. I don't think he's even worried about his farm because he's not thinking about his farm at all either. He's mm -hmm. just, he's just trying to get square with Darren. That's it. He's so been out of shape about being dissed by Darren. Like it just, I, I could not get over it. Like he's like, this is a, like, you know, this will not be tolerated. I will not be tolerated being disrespected. And I'm like, you're not a very respectful person, Avery. Like, yeah. <laughs> He fights all of the guys in the club and takes them all down. Eventually, the big guy from before comes in and compliments Avery on having a pair. Because, I, again, mm -hmm. that's the stereotype of, an, of a self-insert and uh -huh. a power fantasy is everybody has to compliment you. Uh-huh. Everyone's uh, got to compliment even, you. Even the villain. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And that's what Avery's getting. A uh, big guy is like, you should be dead after what that chick did to you. Neglecting that this guy was bloody hard ramming Avery's head against the ground and he wasn't dying. Yeah, I know. I'm just like, like some of the cuts that uh, this big guy fighting Avery before he tossed him a half a mile over to you. Like, <laughs> that should have caved his head in. That could have, yes. Like, you did, oh, so it just dawned on, so like, you didn't realize he was really strong whenever his head wouldn't crack open as you were smashing it against the floor? Yeah. Like, like you didn't notice that then, but like, what that girl did to you, you should have died. Well, clearly he's not dead, so maybe that should be a clue that he's not a normal guy. Yeah. Um, but there's no real mystery to that. Like, we're not sitting here guessing that if Avery is an accept or not. Like, it's pretty obvious that he is one. Because yeah. everything at the very beginning of this comic, um, he... Like, there's, like, ridiculous amount of pages of just this artwork of him beating people up. And then this random one of him and his niece. And it's, like, so, kind of, like, overkill to me. But anyway... <laughs> Uh, while squaring off with the big guy, Avery is like, I came here with respect and was met with disrespect. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we had actually seen him being respectful and allowing the thing to play out. He didn't Darren. say anything. He seemed kind of meek more than yeah. anything. Not like, hey, I'm looking for Jasmine. Have you seen her? Yep. Um, which, you know, Darren could lie and said, no, I hadn't seen her. Yep. Because, you know, like, and then 
that would be disrespectful. And then he maybe could have believed, believed Darren or not believed Darren, but Darren still snitched on himself. And so, I mean, that's just not what we got. Yep. There's so many ways this could have gone and it went the other direction every single time. Like, I felt like we took hard left turns every chance we got. <laughs> like, so he gets into this fight with the big guy going, I'm going to beat your ass. Blame yourself, but give me the credit. Oh my God. <laughs> the guy is like, bro, oh. if you were so self-absorbed, you could make money with your abilities by renting out your, your accept abilities. That was the most ridiculous line in this whole fucking thing. Like, <laughs> do not credit heroism when all this takes place. Blame yourselves, but credit me. I'm like, what in the God? Okay, so you're saying here, openly telling everybody that, hey, I beat the ever-loving Christ out of everybody in this club, but I have a sister and I have a niece and I'm probably endangering Jasmine and her mother because I am so impulsive. I can't control my temper and can't stand it when someone talks down to me and I have to get even with them. So I'm going to do whatever I can to make it known that you got your ass kicked by Avery Silman big red sign come and get me and everyone else is gonna be in trouble not to mention just his family but the people on the farm too you don't think people are gonna find out what happened or where you are yep. like come on man and like, i just can't <laughs> help it with the he's he did what is basically the opposite of a backhanded compliment where it was like an insult but it was like an insult <clears throat> to say you're such a good person uh-huh <laughs> like, but what? he's not the only reason he's here is for selfish reasons. He doesn't want mama to lecture him and he's angry and hurt and offended <laughs> at Darren. Because he got dissed. He angry. He, he angry. Hurt. <laughs> feelings are challenging the big guy. They go outside suddenly. I'm assuming because they're like, we're going to take this outside, but it skips the panel of being like, let's take this outside. Yeah. So they just take it outside. They start fighting. Eventually, they phase through the wall. <laughs> they pay, we yeah. never saw it. Just, they just teleport. They're just there. Um, <laughs> yep. And eventually, Avery beats the big guy with no discernible reason as to why he beats the big guy this time. But he wins. Then the cops show up and they point their gun at Avery. And so then he oh, runs away. He runs away from the cops. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. Like, literally, like, wham, rack. I was like, God, I don't really care. Because the fight, when you look through all this artwork, it's really just boring it's a boring fight i'm not invested in this at all because i really haven't been invested in there's no real urgency with jasmine <clears throat> but and well like why would we be like yeah he beat the big guy when we didn't see any reason as to why he should beat the big guy like exactly it's like there was no training montage there was no self idealization <laughs> there was no costume change <laughs> except I'm for sorry, the hoodie not, it's not iconic he didn't get a haircut iconic. No, we didn't do any of that iconic stuff. I hope <laughs> everyone knows this is just sarcasm. <laughs> like, he didn't do it. Like, why should we care? Like, but that's the thing. It's like, the whole thing around Jasmine has just been there's no agency around Jasmine. Even though Jasmine is kind of being made to be a very important character because she's being trafficked in some way, right? That's what I'm only going to assume. Like, I'm going to assume that she got in debt with Darren, probably borrowed money from him, and now she's paying the consequences of that choice. And it is a sad reality that a lot of people face, and it's a very tragic reality, too. Yep. So I think that it would have been important to see Darren actually care about her. I mean, Avery care about her. I need to stop doing that. I am so sorry. I am not <laughs> deliberately doing this. It really is just kind of... <laughs> It's oh just, I swear, it is just easier to say Darren than Avery. <laughs> anyway, he escapes to his sister's house where he tells her what happened with Darren at his, mm -hmm. his club. And the sister is like, you need to be careful because Darren's reach is more than you know. Or she, it, Yeah, she said that. Why right? didn't like, she say that on the phone with him to that's begin what I was with? Thinking. She's like, like, hey, Avery, go talk to your buddy. And she keeps it secret that he's dangerous. Yeah, exactly. I'm just like, well, wait a second. Yeah, why did like, oh, Darren's reach is like, damn, this is bad. Avery, Darren's reach is a lot I'm further not, than you think. I'm like, not going to call the cops. I'm going to ask my brother to go talk to this criminal enterprise guy who's more dangerous than you know, and I'm not going to tell my brother that he's dangerous. I know, right? I am sitting... <laughs> Like, uh, it's like, it's obvious that Darren has his fingers in a lot of pies, but like, I'm also her going, like, this is no longer a Jasmine problem. 
go tell Mrs. Newman she's alive. I'm like, bitch, why don't you fucking call and tell Mrs. Newman that she's alive? You're the one that got Avery roped in this in the first place. Yep. He didn't bother to tell him that this was going to be a big deal. She knew that his reach was so much farther than what she never told her brother. Like, yep. now come on, girl. Like, don't sit there. Like, you're tampering with forces that ought not to be tampered with. And you have a little girl at home that is an easy target with a deceased father that's not there to keep her safe. Yep. And, and we learned doesn't even want to be there. And we learned that in that scene that because sister and Avery are talking to one another and then the the little old niece comes out and there's expositing information about the dead brother-in-law and that mm -hmm. the, the yeah. niece is coping with it as best that she can. Mm -hmm. Apparently Avery mm -hmm. divorced himself from the city so hard that he never comes to visit them either. Despite knowing how dangerous the city is, that's the reason why he left it. But you know, yeah. his family is not important enough to him to ever visit them because she's like, you know, you could come every once in a while. And apparently the city is also so close that the people on his farm can just go back at the end of the day to go watch the game. So it's not like he lives way out in the boonies like mm -hmm. by three hours. He lives like 30 no. minutes away and he no, never yeah. visits. No, he never visits. And then also you think the same could be said that, well, they don't seem to visit him. So I just don't get this feeling this family is that close. Yeah, so I don't understand the relationship. This doesn't do a very good job of setting up their relationship. And also, it also it, she get, he gets out of the hospital and pings her and then she comes to him. But like in all the other scenes, there's a coldness between them where they don't care about each other. Yeah, I don't really see a very, you know, now my brother and me, like we don't hug, but you could tell we're siblings. Like, I mean, if I needed help, my brother would come help me. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, and, and the whole scene between him and his niece, I felt like was just another reason to sort of like put up Avery on a pedestal because it's like, oh, you're strong like all these other people. That means you're special, right? And I'm just like, oh, God. Yeah, and okay. it also <laughs> felt like a sort of pet the cat moment where it was trying yes. to give Avery a moment to be gentle where he's been angry the whole time. Yes. But it feels so fake because he never sees this girl. No, it doesn't. It does feel really fake. I'm just like, why don't you have your sister and her come stay out on the farm? Maybe yep. she'd like it if you really, like, I just don't get the sense he actually cares about anybody other than himself. Even the people on the farm, again, going back to the fact that when we first meet Avery, he is alone doing a workout. I don't understand because I don't get the sense that he is any kind of alter altruistic type character who's trying to do the right thing. He just does not want to get sold by mama. Yeah. That's really what the motivation was if you boil it down to this. But I find it interesting because in the next scene after he's done talking with Vassy, we uh, are uh, met with Altana and uh, Avery discussing um, this this security footage from uh, Jasmine at Pro Jesus. Uh, I'm only I probably not pronouncing it right, but I don't care. It looks like Pro Jesus. <laughs> um, and like for some reason, you know, they're talking about how like that girl is too smart for her own good because apparently she noticed something that I feel like most children would notice about somebody like that no matter how big i get you pick me up with the same type of like force you've always picked me up with so he makes a comment that she's too smart for her own good blah 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 who cares and anyway so they're talking about the security footage with that they found of jasmine and uh altana notes that she seems to be pacing or that she's pacing and that she's scared of something and then for some reason avery says she's not like she's too controlled to be fearful and i'm just like i really don't know how that contributes to whether or not somebody's fearful yeah if somebody is being threatened and if they're complying because of threats that doesn't mean that they're not fearful or that their obedience isn't being coerced exactly especially since he makes this comment or like um like he goes, the hesitation says a lot. It's about time. Something may have happened to her too early. Something she thought she could hold off. I don't know what they're really talking about. I just feel like this is something that we don't really see because we don't get any close-ups of Jasmine's face or what could possibly be going on. We're just being told through Avery what's going on. And I think that's a really lazy way to do anything is mm -hmm. to say, oh, well, this is happening because I see it. But you the reader or the viewer are not actually seeing it someone's telling you that it's happening i mean it could but, just be a misdirection from the narrative yeah point it could of view. Be. because I, then, because we know that a avery is flawed 
So he could also be misinterpreting, but we also know he doesn't care about people. He doesn't care about Jasmine. He even says so that. He goes, <laughs> I, do, I just, I don't really think his opining on what's on the video and then him dismissing whether she's in danger or not is very helpful to mm -hmm. making him likable or to like watching him because he already doesn't care about her. He doesn't. And it, in, um, even Altana goes, you think it's Darren on the call, a debt maybe? Don't know. And right now I don't care. We have to look out for us now. I'm out. You need to carry that piece wherever you go, even to your job. If he so thought he that it was this dangerous, why did he just go in like he did? Exactly. It's like, okay, then now you've been jeopardized your fucking family, Avery. Way to go. Like 10 out of 10. Okay, dude, 10 out of 10. Now we skip over to Darren ranting about oh my the God. word empire, how, what the word empire means, and how if you have one, it's always growing and everyone's always waiting for the big dog to fall so that they can take over. And Avery has challenged the club, which is no small thing. Maybe if Darren was worried about this whole, you know, dog fighting club thing up uh -huh. within the city politics, he shouldn't have threatened his own security and well-being by telling Avery everything about his business being dirty. No, he shouldn't have. It's like, why did you open your mouth, you big fucking cow? Are you out of your mind? Like, come on, dude. And then not only that, I find it hilarious. He pulls a Leonardo DiCaprio from Django Unchained, which is where he smashes the glass with his hand for whatever reason because he's mad like i feel like this is such a shoddy attempt to make darren seem like he's really intelligent where i feel like darren and avery now share a single brain cell together because they're both like so hyper fixated on each other that mm -hmm. they care about nothing else so it says that it seems like um like i'll uh it'll <clears throat> It'll be a message for all my history with them. Given what what did he say? He goes like, "I'm sending a memo in in the morning uh, with the details of this man and what I'll expect from you. You'll immediately re uh, realize that one thing: uh, certain things are not off limits." So that's what he says. So he's basically put a hit out on Avery. Mm -hmm. So if that means certain things are not off limits, who do you think that he's talking about? Mm -hmm. What is one of the things that you don't? or they, people who have a code, essentially, what do you not mess with? You don't mess with the children. Mm -hmm. Who do you think that that's talking about? He's talking about that little girl. I almost guarantee that's who he's talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so skip. I thought that that was really interesting. Sorry. Oh, no, you're good. We skip to the next morning. So Avery is at some building mm -hmm. with Taylorsville on it. We don't have any description, but Taylorsville is apparently a giveaway because it is a Taylor. Yeah, I thought business. that was very on the nose. <laughs> <That was> so... <laughs> the guy outside is smoking and doesn't recognize Avery as I saw him. Somehow, I don't understand. I don't I saw him understand doesn't that either. wear a mask. <laughs> no, he doesn't. Like, how do you not recognize him? Is it that? Is it because his face is so un? But he's like. But he's like, I don't recognize you. And then he's like, bro, thank you so much. You're the only person that has ever returned stuff to me. So how do you both not recognize somebody, but then also recognize him and remember right. him? Because he is the only one that ever gave you anything back. Exactly. That I didn't understand that either. And it was also another thing too. He's, this is another example of people complimenting Avery, where mm -hmm. we have not really seen Avery do anything commendable this whole time that is warranted or deserving of compliment complimentary yep. things. So also, I, <laughs> I wondered why it was so vague because this book has a problem with constantly being vague at all of its yes, purposes. And it does. for me, it feels like it's a lack of commitment by the author because the author doesn't want to make a choice and then box himself in later so that then he can say things. But there's also the opportunity to be like, oh, I didn't tell you what it is. So you're going to question what it is. But when you're purposefully hiding things from readers, it is not suspenseful. It reminds me of Grady Hendrix in the oh, God. Southern it was Housewives. The, it was the Southern Housewives where the old lady that was taking care of the mother-in-law like opened a box and there was a picture inside. And obviously we were in that lady's perspective. So we should have seen what was in the box, but it didn't show the reader the picture because it didn't want to spoil the mystery. But it no. reads so obvious as censoring the image so the reader can't see it. Yes. 100%. And it's not natural. And so that's what a lot of this felt like too is, oh, I'm going to hide stuff from the reader because not telling the reader stuff is suspenseful. But that's not it, really how it works. No, no you, you hide certain aspects to the larger, like larger part of the narrative. 
but not the need to know stuff because if you hide everything then what is what do people have to really invest their time in if yep. they can't know anything about what's happening other than what's happening right now is that he's a pissed off black man trying to get at this other guy who dissed him well see look That's, here's here's an example of a good mystery and a bad mystery in this good okay. mystery what is the ankle bracelet that avery is wearing we mm -hmm. don't need an answer to that right now but you no. can introduce it have it there have us be going what is yep. that but then you don't say with this guy that's like, oh, I remember you. You're the only person that's ever returned anything to me. That's not a mystery that needs to be happening. If you no. tell us what that item is, it'll tell us a lot about these characters. One, what did Avery borrow? Mm -hmm. Two, why was it so important? Exactly. Three, does he borrow this kind of stuff out all the time? Right. Like, yeah, we're not asking to know, like, what was this, like, some detailed backstory about Avery as I saw him. Like, but there are certain things that like, really, if you just let the audience know, the reader know, it really does invest us in, like, we get interested in what's happening. If you tell us something, yep, I feel like depth and investment yeah, by dropping does. details that are important mm -hmm. Yep, for stuff like this. Yes, absolutely. And I also found this to be really like kind of annoying and actually too long of this all this exposition that i just oh, yeah. to be really like I, oh my god i could not believe that this ended all with exposition about a character from a character that we've not met before so the whole last of the pages is him is avery going to this tailor that makes superhero costumes and they his business has expanded in the last couple of years since avery went away and they go underground and avery is asking for his costume back because for some reason he wants his costume back i don't know why uh, and the guy is yeah, like, well, I, I can't give it back to you yet because it's kind of outdated and I would be embarrassed if you wear it. Now, the outfit that he's given to wear for this so that he could try it on so the guy can make mm -hmm. adjustments, it looks just like the one on the cover. So yeah. by outdated, when I was reading that, I took it as I need to change the design because it kind of matches the design of like 10 years ago and I need you to mm -hmm. look more contemporary. But if that's the truth, then the the him Why in the costume yeah. on the covers shouldn't match the costume from 10 years ago because it would need to be updated before he's allowed to take it not a, yeah exactly That's the implication. so like i don't necessarily like unless there's some sort of hot like gadgets that he has hidden underneath that like you know spandex then i don't see any other reason as to why he would make a comment like that yeah and it's true it, it like this whole expositional thing i also find it really humorous that they said that they they used to make costumes for like the wwe type people like wrestlers because superhero costumes do fucking look like wrestler <laughs> costumes um oh. but yeah he, he gets his suit and stuff and then it's like ah, oh, yeah it still fits like why are you getting your suit if you don't even want to be involved in the city like i feel like there hasn't been any real substantial reason that he has given that he wants or or like has been implied that he wants to continue to do this but why is he wanting to continue to do it as i saw him yeah and how does the suit help is he going yeah, to how go does and the suit help? would need like is he going to contact old people that he comrades that he used to fight crime with because he wants that to help with mm -hmm. uh darren but he has to be in the suit and recontract <clears throat> with the stuff in order for that to be like we don't have any motivation for why he went to the suit and why the suit was necessary it's just supposed to be like some cool moment. That's really, I feel like all this is, is just, oh, he's finally in his suit now. Look at what we got. But I don't know if it's because, oh, well, maybe if I'm on my suit, Darren won't recognize me. Without and my, my family will be without my mask on. Maybe he I'm should have like, done that before. Yeah. Like, uh, now come on, dude. But like, the, ex the exact quote from these pages from this guy is, you can't have it back. Not like it is because you're representing me and my brand by wearing this. And frankly, this design is embarrassing. Which means if the design isn't different in book two when he's wearing it, then that line is a lie because the design mm -hmm. should have changed. And that's anyway, pretty much where this yep. book ends. Is it, It's got an image of him in the suit being like it still fits. And then we get some random inserts of a couple other pages of what looks like another comic that has to do with ah. like Nordic, Viking, rock stars. <laughs> but it is so jarring because so many of the scenes throughout ISOM are short handfuls of pages with different characters interjected. And there's nothing mm -hmm. to tell you that this is a completely different comic yeah. until it does like a title page at the end. So it's Dude. just really confusing. <laughs> It was confusing. I know that some comics do that, but usually from what I understand, the comics kind of let you know before you go into this other like 
comic that that's what you're about to get in because it makes mm -hmm. me wonder if like because i thought the same thing i thought oh is this happening like miles and miles away in another city somewhere somewhere in florida obviously but i said like you know like it's a toss-up between the god of thunder himself and the fucking val hallen from the justice friends <laughs> <laughs> If anybody doesn't know who Val Hallen is, like, look it up. It's freaking hilarious. He's he's perfect. That's actually kind of probably more of a compliment than it, you know, than an insult because Val Hallen's great. Um, but yeah, it we have like the the rocking Nordic gods whose eyes are glowing. They're bearded, and it's like okay, well, all right. And then I. I we get to the end of that and then it's the Nordic gods again. I really don't care what these people are saying because I just invested my time sort of in ISOM and I was like I really don't like know why these characters have been introduced because this just makes me think of like oh wow another Nordic Viking god and they happen to be in a band and um well, I'm also at the end of this comic, and I'm not going to get a chance to invest in whatever this is because I've already just been jerked around for 70 pages on something else. Exactly. And With no it, sense of who Avery is other than an angry man. An angry and selfish man. Angry and selfish man, exactly. And, um, you know, I, I'm just sitting here, and I'm just like, this is a waste of... I just don't think this should be $40. I found this to be very interesting in a bad way because I was not entertained. I was not invested. All I kept seeing were just inherent structural issues. I'm not the greatest at illustrating a lot of the technicalities that would go into actually fixing this. But like I said, Darren's speech at the end when we last see Darren would have been a perfect fit for adding in the farm scenes and then implying that somebody's on the farm preparing to hurt Jim and the others. I kept calling Jim Sam. I don't know why. I, I just it happens like I keep calling Avery Darren but um oh so, yeah um that was I saw him issue one and uh, so a couple of extra thoughts just in general for like mm -hmm. where to break some things up characters every section of this was about three to four pages for the most part and so you got mm -hmm. to the fight scenes where they were a little bit longer by a little bit I mean like four or five times as long as pretty yeah. much any of the character scenes and the skipping around a lot took the reader away from actually getting a seat mm -hmm. in the comic and getting to know anybody. And then you also got in between most of these scenes, you just got random people thrown at you who didn't matter, who didn't get a personality. Like the precinct, a bunch of people that don't matter. Then we got Avery. Then we got like farm thing. And then we got Darren. And then we got farm thing with other <laughs> random teenagers. And then we <laughs> yeah. got, so like you just kind of got jerked around with no way yes. to get seated in anything and so this yeah. book could and should have been focused on darren and the sister and avery and building up that so that we are invested by the end on what is going to happen to them and the farm like we talked about earlier yeah so beginning and ending with the farm and the danger that's coming to the farm after getting us to bond yep yeah honestly like it's really interesting because i felt like every character interaction was extremely shallow yeah i didn't you know could not find anything to invest in or any person to invest in the, and it's interesting too, like, and I was saying this earlier, I feel like we were, um, or really, I, I think I wrote it down in my notes, but it's it's somewhere in the ether in those notes. I don't even remember where I placed it in the notes, but I said, I feel like we're getting more characterization for these people who don't fucking matter than the main character himself. Because mm -hmm. all we see from Avery, Avery, <laughs> is that he is hot tempered and impulsive and then he wants to go be Darren and that is the only thing driving him and motivating him and I think those are really shallow reasons to try and actually be some sort of hero which I feel like it's implying that you know Avery was a hero at one point there's no hiding that or getting around that no one's beating around the bush with that one mm -hmm. but you know I I didn't get a real good sense of like identity from him mm -hmm. it just felt like everything was just showy and flashy Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, but you do have to, I don't care if this is like the first issue of something, you do have to try your best to get people invested. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, it makes me think that I don't know how many people are invested in this because I really haven't seen that many people talking about it, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I'm just like, well, why, are, why, would, why should I care and be invested? Because I have not seen one thing here today that has made me feel like I should care because all I have 
really seen from an outsider looking in is that this man is very not good. He's not very happy. He's angry. And would it kill you to smile a little bit, Avery? Would it? Like, it could have even been, I mean, this is going into a completely different direction, but mm -hmm. it could have been an interesting concept that he got kicked out of protecting the city because of his anger. You're right. I feel like that's one of the reasons he could have gotten kicked out. Even though he says he left on his own, it would have been a lot more interesting if he was forced out. Mm -hmm. And then that would and be then, the audience wondering why he was forced out. And then you see kind of why over the course of time, because he's not very practical. And then there could have been like an interaction with the Taylorsville guy where he's like, oh, what are you doing here? You know, you can't have your suit because it was returned to us because you're not allowed to do X, Y, or Z. But yeah. then, you know, Darren and I. <laughs> sorry, but, then, sorry. but then Avery is like, hey, but like you don't know me as that guy. Remember that time I returned X, Y, Z, or I did thing for you. And then Taylor guy is like, well, I could get in big trouble for this, but yeah, okay, so he but he maybe, I'll, maybe I'll make you a new suit because you can do like the moral gray or kind of the imperfection and he's going yes. to get his reputation back in a way or another by proving himself. But there but are so many ways that this could have gone that yeah. allows for growth for Avery, but it doesn't really look like this book wanted to show Avery as really having flaws that affect him and have affected him. So he's just yes. gotten everything that he's wanted. Like he became a farmer and moved out of the city because he wanted to, not because he shamed himself and got kicked out of whatever and then had to go and make a life somewhere else. And he didn't want to be in the city because everybody knew that he was a disgraced except. Yes, and not only that, but it would also be the guy saying that I'm going to make you a new suit could also be symbolic of him burning down the old version of himself to build up a new version of himself mm -hmm. by donning a new suit. Yeah. And it's like, I really feel like that could have been your disgrace ex except who was impulsive, got people hurt, got people distract. And that's why he doesn't want to go in the city. Maybe mm -hmm. that's why he doesn't want to go see his, his sister or his niece because he's too ashamed of himself mm -hmm. for what the way he treated. And he's afraid that he's going to bring down a bunch of bullshit onto his family. So he mm -hmm. moved away from the city to avoid any of that and maybe work on himself. Yeah, right. and then his first interaction in there with Darren while he's trying to hold in his anger because that's always been a weakness for him and uh -huh. then he loses it and then he's got a major chip on his ego. He majorly just mm -hmm. feels really terrible about himself because he just lost it and that's the same thing that got him kicked out before and it's why he avoids the city. It's why he hates the city. Yes. Like there's like, so much that could have been done here with this character to make him compelling and to give him a compelling journey, but his flaws would have to be recognized and he would have to have been punished for those flaws. But this book tries so hard to make him a praise for his flaws. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It really does. And that is um, uh, a really a shame because it's a missed opportunity because like even just saying that I would have been in emphatically more invested in that type of character because I am somebody who has a temper. I am someone who's been embarrassed by my temper. Like I, I can get red hot mad, dude, and say some shit that I don't mean, you know, and I know what that's like. I feel like that could have been a relatable, you know, thing about him. I'm not saying that you have to be relatable, but I feel like it could have been a nice surprise to say, hey, look, this guy is is human too, even if he has these abilities. Mm -hmm. And it's it's it, he had a hard time with his temper. Maybe he had a rough time growing up. I feel like it would have been interesting if he didn't have both his parents and maybe only had one of them because they never mentioned Avery's father. It's only the mention of his mother. So I feel like, well, I mean, it, what about Avery's dad? Be it yeah. could still be interesting if he has both parents. And so looking from the outside, Darren just Darren sees that he's got both of his parents and they're in a middle class life. And so he assumes that it's a good life. Like a lot of people assume yeah. two parents is better than one parent. But if one of your two parents is abusive or one of your two parents steamrolls the other one. Mm -hmm. And so then he maybe got an anger um, because he had to fight with his dad for dominance for one reason or another, because boys mm -hmm. at a certain age and then they, they, they have that power dynamic of the younger son becoming the man of the house and dad either needs to give respect or they're going to do this. Yes. Like not that the teenager is going to become the man of the house, but dad needs to recognize the son is now a man. Absolutely. Going to fight. Like that happens with every teen that I have heard of. Yeah, I, yeah, gosh, like, I, I mean, even with me and my mother, I mean, you know, you know the history of that. Me and my mom, like, have had some huge freaking fights, some huge freaking fights because it's a power dynamic. 
-hmm. doesn't mean that I don't respect my mother. It just means that I'm an adult. And I'm even when I was growing up, you know, I was trying to establish a sense of individualism apart from my family or an individual in my house doesn't mean that I wouldn't obey rules, but uh, granted I'm a female. It's very different from men, I would assume. But, um, you know, you, there is a power dynamic there that you start to notice as you get older and you start to realize that, oh, well, I don't really have to listen. And if the person you're listening to is not great or is abusive, that's going to build resentment and contempt for somebody and it might build contempt in your heart because you're in this very confusing place of like, well, I love my family, but I hate that they do this and I feel conflicted that could develop in his anger. And so the way he got his way to establish his dominance is by getting in fights and losing his temper. And so maybe that carried on with him outside the house and he became a superhero. And also it makes him dangerous too, because if he's an accept and he's as strong as he is, then he could easily overpower his father. But this is all completely hypothetically speaking here. My point was just that he could have two parents and there's this mm -hmm. assumption that if you have two parents then your household is gonna be better off and more perfect. And it doesn't have to be. You can end up having no. two parents and people from the outside can look at your two parents and think that you've got it made. But on the inside, you the don't know what's going on. The politics and the dynamics of that family are not what you think from the outside. Exactly. A lot and of so people. That could have been another thing brought in. Yes, I really think so too. It's like, oh, well, yeah, not everything is sunshine and roses. I mean, look at the Mendez brothers. They claim that their parents were doing horrible things to them, but everyone thought that they were living the highest of high lives. Mm hmm. So, I mean, you never know what's going on behind closed doors. You really don't. So this whole two parent household thing that I've heard over and over again, it's really not always true. Yep. And you that know? could have contributed to Avery's yep. perspective. It's exactly. One of the things I wanted to mention with the story structure is that this book is 77 pages long. It oh, is yeah. only 30 pages of Avery not in a fight scene, which is why it feels like it's not doing anything is a yes. majority of those 30 pages then are exposition dumping and not him actually being an active person. Yeah, not at all. Like he's hard, not an active person. People kind of feel like mistaken that for action when in reality, it's, it's just not. It's like stuff is happening to Avery. He's not really making it happen himself. Mm -hmm. it's, it, that's why it feels like he's getting caught up in this mess rat, and then also, you know, at the same time, making a mess for himself rather than him being truly proactive because he doesn't want to be doing this. It's established over and over and over again. He does not want to be here and yet mm -hmm. he still stays, but it's not because he's worried about any of these people that are in danger, but because he's mad at Darren. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's the only sort of reason why he stayed behind. And that's a very weak motivation. And I just, I don't really see how that's supposed to be endearing in some way you know that's why a lot of these superheroes from these older previous comics are so popular and endearing to people is because there is some there's depth to them mm -hmm. and um what you were saying earlier before it's like nothing that's why it feels like nothing is happening because the structure is so weird and it's really just things happening to him Mm -hmm. So that's why I feel like it also contributes to this idea that there's nothing happening either. And also the way everything is broken up into fights. Like there's more pages of him in fights, like you were saying, than there are of him actually doing something other than yeah. getting mad and then throwing a temper tantrum and causing his own issues. So like. So then one of the final things, I only have two more topics to talk about okay. on this. One of them is the art, because obviously it's yes. a comic book. So we need mm -hmm. to talk about the art. Images tell stories. And the covers of this book, all of them have him in the super suit that he only gets at the very end. Now, this might seem like a small thing, but if you're going to introduce us to this character where he's not wearing the super suit, why is he in the super suit on all of the covers? Not yes. even one of them in his regular wear because he's rejected the title of Isom, which is how he got out in the, the boonies, mm -hmm. is we're yeah. assuming. The second mm -hmm. thing, why is Yara on a cover when she's literally not important at all? The idea No, of I forgot put, all about her. <laughs> actually, you put on the cover tells you what is important to the story. It puts yes. emphasis on what's on the story. And so the Yara cover with them doing a fist fist battle makes it look like that's going to be the arch enemy in this story when actually it's Darren. Yeah. And so yeah, I... there are some confusing like mixed signals sent about what is in the book just based on the cover and the cover doesn't really give any indication of the vibes or the story that is going to be told within 
Right. Yeah, no, I agree. Like, none of the art, actually, none of the art, like, the covers is misleading. Like, there was a whole, it's funny you say that, because there's that, kind of the same thing happening in book covers, too, actually, um, for novels. Uh, especially within the horror genre, I watched this video, this is relevant, I promise, but, like, a lot of these novels or these covers don't match the content of what's going on in the book. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's the same thing that happened here where we see Yara and Isom fighting each other, but that literally never happens. He doesn't, they, they don't really fight Yara. Yara just beats him up, throws him down, he crash lands on a car. But that's mm-hmm. the last time we see the bitch. She just flies off and we go, you know, to wherever. So we don't know what happens to her. And that's why the whole scene of them in the beginning in the police precinct animating or saying, oh, she's back, really doesn't mean anything in the long run. Mm -hmm. We don't know what happened for two weeks. We don't even know if the, you know, like now that I think about it, it's like, could like, you know, like two weeks later, is it earlier in the day or was it like, I just, I just don't know. Like, is this two weeks before what's supposed to happen happens in the main story? Like there's really no, the continuity in this book is kind of all over the place, actually. (laughs) Like it really is. But then going back to the art, because we can, I wanted to compare a couple of different art styles, some of them closer to the tradition and some of them different because I wanted to show, I'm not an art snob. (laughs) So I like some art. I should show you, I should show you the freaking experimental comic book that Sam sent me that is just like, poof. (laughs) (laughs) But so we've got Uh this picture. First, I wanted to compare these two. Okay. Uh, so first we got obviously a picture from ISOM and I wanted to do a full show, a full page illustration of it to compare it to this full page illustration from Shad Brooks's graphic Shadow. novel version, Shadow of the Conqueror. But between these two images, Shad's artist, which is, who is Mike Miller, actually has more dynamic and there's more color. What I noticed when I was comparing this to other comic mm-hmm. books that I have, because I do collect art books and comic books, mm-hmm. is that Eric July's book is pretty like single tone. All of the yes. shading is in black. And then pretty much like you've got a little bit of highlight here. Yeah, there's much, a little shading on her leg, but nothing that yeah, pretty no much cool is colors. just mono monocolor. There's not yeah. really emphasis. Nothing in here really pops. But if you go over to to Shaz, yes. there is so much color and there's so much life. And even just mm-hmm. where let's go back to her hair. Like you see, you got a little bit of the darkness here. Mm-hmm. Just a little shading. You, little shading but then like compare that to how his hair this has multiple kind of like this has some yellows and some silvers and some grays and stuff like this is somebody really understands values and colors and also there's so much scope in the way that shad's artist has like created this image in this comments also i'm not gonna i'm trying not to comment but i'm gonna do it anyway the butt (laughs) crack on this this yes i saw that i was like that's great (laughs) that was great uh, but I really do prefer this because it's still similar in, in uh, you know, its construction and its, you know, way it's drawn. But the coloring is a lot better than the one that's on the, the yeah, left. There's just or something this one that's right dead about this. And then you look at the expressions. The expressions bothered me, too, because in a lot of the ISOM pages, the faces are just not there. Or they're half colored with just yes. black. Yes. They yeah, didn't that's... actually even really... Like, I don't want to say they didn't shade it, but it's a lot of stuff like this where it's just color over it with black so you don't have any dimensions. But even this guy down here. Yeah. You got his face in there. And there is look so at the, much. It's like, reflecting look at, back. The, like, look at so much ex- personality. Yeah, look at these expressions. Even back here with these guys. You can see their expression on Dalen and Eric. Eric, Eric, I, I, whatever. But, <laughs> whatever you know, but there's. <laughs> <laughs> but there is so much more, it feels like, investment and life and personality in this. And they're both going for more realism styles. Yes. Speaking of which, um, I have my own art to show. I'm actually going to show someone who is a, a popular comic book cover artist known as Jeff DeCall. But you see his work and you see the beauty in his work. And I love just going through what he does. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and um, let's see here, share screen. I'm gonna go here to Jeff DeCall's portfolio. And here we are um, with this gorgeous image. Um, he's not your typical comic book cover artist because there's definitely flair and style to what he does. And there's a lot of scope and you can see like just the way he does things with his colors and his backgrounds and everything just has scope 
and magnitude and even if it's just a simple image like this i love the way he does paint strokes it feels very fluid and natural mm -hmm. and then you have something like this up here which this is clearly more realism since we were talking about the style of this artist that eric july used and this one is in some way similar what if i can uh, it's not gonna let me zoom in on it um, I'm trying to like, but I don't know if you can see very well or if anybody can see very well at all. Um, but I'm actually on his, his official website and I can't like open the image in another tab. But, you know, you see this one's a lot more like the style that's in um, Eric July's comic book. But even then, there's personality in this. You can see their faces clearly. There's nothing obscuring their faces. Like you can definitely see the expressions there. Um, and this one up here, like this right here i mean you can even see that guy's expression even with the shading which a lot of the yeah. time with i saw him it seemed like the shading was specifically dehumanizing all of the characters yes i saw i was telling you earlier like exactly like there seemed to be something that just kind of removed them and put them in this uncanny valley-esque like position where mm -hmm. when i looked at their faces it was like so dull and lifeless and even when they were supposed to be expressing it's like it's a comic book man just hey, go go run with it go run with it and go ham with it and be expressive like i cannot stand seeing art where it's it, on the surface level it looks gorgeous but then when you start to evaluate it you are remote it's it's smoke and mirrors it looks well, nice to the average eye but there's nothing really there or what there's also I also want to mention that stuff like that stylizations like that where you erase mm -hmm. the face or you put less detail on the face mm -hmm. also sends a message like the way that where you put emphasis or take away emphasis says something about the world that you're interacting with and mm -hmm. so in the case of when you're depersoning people in the art style mm -hmm. they're also sort of expressing these aren't people nobody cares about each other this is very very separate so it can be a distinct choice made mm -hmm. by the artist to say don't see this person as person mm -hmm. and say like maybe you're in a story where somebody is super in their own head and they are mm -hmm. separated from society around them and as they start interacting with society more they start seeing the mm -hmm. detail in other people's faces more and you can yeah. show them through visual storytelling yeah um but i don't feel like that was necessarily the choice being made here maybe it was because i can't guess what the authors in the right intent was. but the intent yeah the there was an odd dehumanization and an odd destruction of the human face throughout i saw that I yeah they seemed very obstructed by shadows and it just didn't work and like uh, it, I, it's not if some people really like that but for me i just did not really enjoy the style of this and artwork. that could also go for anonymity and anonymity and anonymity. if you want it to be like when you're in the city it's you're more anonymous uh -huh. so it's harder to get to know people because everybody is so isolated and then if it changed it when it's on the farms that you've got more visual Pers detail yeah. because you're getting to know colors more, are more stuff, connected yeah. like you could do that visually too but I didn't see that. I saw him just felt like really muted in general in all of its scenes and missing dimension. And there we go. Dimension is the word I was looking for. I was looking at it. There was just a lot to say about the artwork. I just could not put my finger on it other than the faces were obstructed by like really random shadows and shading. And yep. um, this is not to make any like we're not saying this artist is bad i just did not care for how he colored and and did the way the faces and stuff like that this is not for me personally i just yeah. think it takes away from the story yep i'm just um, i'm just comparing to other things to kind of give something to mm -hmm. think about so yes, like if you exactly. look at this art style because this is much more simple it's much more stylized than i saw him. but even on this little face down here you've got more personality than you saw mm -hmm. in most even like this little thing that's not even fully yeah it's too long. you still have a character and characterization mm -hmm. in that which you don't get mm -hmm. i feel like even this face right here because of the shadow mm -hmm. you have more dimension here than was typically in oh Ice. absolutely absolutely there's so much more dimension in this and it's kind of rem reminiscent of like the old uh 1990s batman cartoon style where they all had this sort of look to them like this i don't really understand what the or know what they call that style but it reminds me of those that that cartoon that was really popular back in the day mm -hmm. um 
very nice. There was another one. one. I grabbed this one from Kickstarter, which we're going to go through our, yeah, Kickstarter. Uh -huh. We're going to go through a couple of these pages, but this has so much color and dimension. And if things pop in this the way that they didn't pop with that Yara picture. Mm -hmm. And it feels cool there too. They also, I love the color scheme, the overlay that they have on this mm -hmm. because it feels like it's cold there. I love the simple design. And this one has obviously more hot color tones. It's not as yep. cold. And the shading um, is like, even though it's a dark place, you've got all mm -hmm. of the shading to help add the dimension where there really, there was only the harsh blackness on the style of Isom. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's the ice on for a comparison because here's an action scene. It's so, like, so empty. It's, like going back to those scenes, like there's no personality in this. It's like just there's sterilized. No, there's, there's no shadow behind him. And you don't have to do all sorts of shadow because that is going to be a choice. But like, there's just nothing. Mm -mm, no. Here's another one that I grabbed from Kickstarter that has another similar style, like a typical comic book. Mm -hmm. I feel like I recognize this artist. But again, you've got way more color here than on ISOM. And then here's Oh, this one's one. incredible. Look at the backdrop on that. And I love the simple um, character designs here with this incredible background and design. Like, this is incredible. Like, the colors. He does the, incredible work, man. You know, very incredible work. I'm very impressed with this. And then here's another one. Again, where you have even these, just these small, even if you're in a dark room, if you add uh -huh. this pop of an off color, and you really didn't have that even in like, here's a yellow, but why does this not stand out in the same way that this does? I don't know. I feel like there's a lot more scope with it too. Like there's uh, angles and dimensions and things that this, this does not, this just feels like, uh, this is just not something that I think of as being like a fantastic comic book that I've seen because I grew up reading, you know, Claremont's version, Run of the X-Men. And then by comparison, associating Claremont's Run of the X-Men with this ISOM stuff, I'm just like, what a waste. <laughs> because Claremont was an incredibly talented writer and um, that, you know, he never talked down to his audience in any way. And I feel like seeing this writing and stuff like that, just in the artwork, I just makes me sad, dude. Like, you know, like comics are really good can be really good i just don't like what people are doing with them these days but anyway so, so another thing that i wanted to mention for this was following the scenes because that's this is the scene where it specifically stood out to me i mm -hmm. apparently forgot to uh capture the image before this where they're inside of the club mm -hmm. because the the panel before this they're inside of the club and then he's like you know check the cameras and then they're suddenly outside. Outside they phase through, dude. They so then we've got, and then we've got these, which makes it look, these buildings here, where it makes it look like they're in the middle of the street based on the position yeah. of this. Yeah, so like the I, next panel. And it looks like and, they're in a parking lot or on top of and a roof. And they're right next to a building instead of being in the middle of the parking garage or the parking lot. It has no real sense of place. That was something else I noticed like, too, was that like, it feels so empty. What is this? Because like we that's go right. To the, I feel like they're, go, they're on top that of looks a like roof. a bridge. But like we go to this previous page, there are all of these windows in this stone thing. Mm -hmm. The frick is I this? Like, this reminds me of the top of a rooftop. I swear to God, like look at the over there, the background behind the big guy. It's a shadow, and then this big block in the center. Like I feel like that's the stairwell that leads up to so, like the rooftop of a large building, and back there is the the railing keeping people and from falling off. But, you've like, got they windows, get and you've got windows right there, but. Where are the windows on these three other panels? Yeah, so what it's happened? Not, it's not keeping. And then where the frick is this? Yeah, like where do they go? They this just doesn't go look anything the like the walls on the previous pages. No, and because this doesn't not, look like the ground on the previous page. No, it doesn't. There's an inconsistency here. I feel like, like, did he run away? Did he get thrown to uh, like another half a mile away to different locations every time this big guy chucked him? Like, and if he did, it, then we needed some establishing shots yes. to show the movement of the fight. Yeah. If this is but, an alleyway, then show us them going in the alleyway or give us mm -hmm. panel by panel of them getting in the alleyway, whether it's they're thrown in the alleyway or they mm -hmm. run in the alleyway or something. Mm -hmm. But all of these pages have a different scene in the background. Yeah, so that compared, implies this. Compared There's to this, fluidity. where we've got, so he's walking in here, you can still see it's the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. And it's still scene by scene, you can see how it's moving and mm -hmm. transforming. You're seeing like the whole room, like a There shot. we go, yes. Because you go from him looking at, sitting on this area, looking over the side mm -hmm. at the whole rest of the room. 
And then it's just the next and scene. And you can see, see how he's changed. This scene is going through the bedroom and it keeps the consistency yeah. of what the bedroom looks like. And the same with this shot where this guy is climbing out of this Wherever. vent. Wherever. Yeah, this vent. <laughs> Looks like and you still up. in each of the panels where it shows the background because not all of them have the background which is fine uh -huh. but you still go see this background where it's the wall oh look it's still the same <laughs> yep it's still the same it's so we got a same. sense of place and then we've got this last one. Oh, that's cute <laughs> where you can see it's all the same place mm -hmm. but that's not <laughs> i'm gonna go get ready <laughs> That's cute. That's so funny. <laughs> Ball? Yes or no? Oh, that's so cute. Anyway, so you see the visual storytelling, and I just didn't see that in a lot of the scenes in Isom. It kind of just teleported places. Yeah, I know. I noticed that too, actually. I was like, I feel like we're jumping around, and I can't. I was, I was more so focused on the dialogue and stuff and what's happening to write down the synopsis into my notes but you never know you picked up on stuff that i just i just didn't notice but then i was like or didn't notice until i realized i was like wait a second finally oh, proof that i'm not an art snob that only looks at like realism stuff or like super really well done stuff this is a really stylized version of something but even for me because you've got different shades of purple that also uh -huh. have shading on them this still feels like it has more dimension to me than that than i saw yes no, I would agree. It actually got color popping. Like you've got the black, you've got the white, you've got different shades of purple. Uh huh. That gives this building in front of those buildings that makes these stand out against each other. Look at those colors on this, like or the purple. Like I love it when people can draw with one color. Oh, that's one of my favorites. Oh, it's so good. Like and that's fun too. Kind of reminds me of Sam's style a little bit, just a little bit. Uh, well, Sam completely. sent me that comic, so... Oh, he did? Oh, that makes a lot of sense, then. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. I love Sam's art. It's so much fun, dude. Um, now, it's really cute. We have one more thing to talk on this. Okay. And which this is, is the million-dollar question. Is this book political? I Not... ask you while I okay. share. Oh, ask me? This. Okay. I well... ask you while I share. Taxation. I said something <laughs> in my notes. I'm like, okay, like that's a really interesting choice. I understand that he wears that hat a lot, but he also wears a bunch of different hats too. Um, we aren't done quite yet. Um, I could go into why that placement of wording is just kind of weird, but that's just a nitpick. Yeah. But yeah, I feel like overall the story itself, if you remove these panels, because there's actually three panels that um, indicate some this is actually more agenda driven and really trying to stick it to the big two which are marvel and dc mm -hmm. um than it is about story and creating great stories with great characters because there was a not enough in this first issue to really invest my time in mm -hmm. and i think adding this into your story kind of randomly saying we aren't done yet with the taxation is theft that's a political statement regardless of whoever says that it's not that is a political statement i think it's very interesting that he chose this to be a intermission like piece uh, um, when he could have chosen a bunch of other things i think that this is a political statement he's got his arms crossed he's looking kind of mean mugging it at the camera and i feel like that's a message to dc and marvel like you're, yeah, and you know, we're not done. And so I wouldn't care about the we're not done yet as a reference to the next comic pages because this yeah. was right before the introduction to the Viking comic. So mm -hmm. that's what yeah. I assume we're not done yet is this we're going to be creating more stuff. But yeah. I look at this hat here because he had somebody render this specifically and printed this specifically. So if you're going to go to a movie and have a problem with somebody wearing an I'm with her hat, a love Trump's hate hat, a protect trans lives hat, any sort of political sloganeering, mm -hmm. and then get mad that that is in the background and then call that a political statement, then you cannot specifically insert this hat and say that it is unpolitical. Exactly, exactly. And this was an artistic choice to put in mm -hmm. here to share with the viewers of this content, to Absolutely. share value with the viewers of this content. There were so many things that could have been here and that is not a political statement, but that is a political statement. And so you cannot say that there is nothing political about that book 
everything when you about put this comic bumper is... sticker comments in random places. Yes. And I'm sorry, but what I said earlier, I hadn't really seen many people talking about this comic. I, I really mean that. I, I haven't seen anybody talking about the story structure of this comic. It's only been just recently that people have been talking about the structural issues in ISOM. For the most part, it's just been Eric July's audience um, really enjoying it, which is good. I'm glad they're enjoying it. But I think um, when people finally got their hands on it outside of the audience, that's whenever, you know, the, the critique started flowing in. And I think there is a, an agenda driven because everything about this, you know, whenever I heard before the, the structural stuff before the, I heard about the politics before I heard about the story of Islam. I didn't have any clue what Islam was about. Mm -hmm. I just knew that it was by Eric July, and I know Eric July as being a really big political commentator on this channel, but he politically comments on social issues too, mm -hmm. um, or comic issues as well. So. And I did a video like before I saw him released. And the only way that I heard about it was because of political posturing of saying, yes. Hey, this is against the big two. The big two are disgracing you by taking these properties and yeah. putting woke stuff in them. And so come to me where I'm not going to put woke stuff in it, where I'm going yeah. to respect my customers, where the progressive comic industry doesn't. And he, that's how I heard about him as somebody not me related too. to that sphere at all. I, I used to watch Eric July, um, but I, I kind of stopped over time because I felt like things were getting a little too echo chambery over there. And I don't like sticking around places too long when they start to become that way. So I just moved on to different, you know, better things, I would say. And then didn't hear anything about it until much later, whenever he, you know, um, uh, the Ethan Van Skyver thing happened, I guess, where, where that, um, where they were talking about his book having structural issues and it was this whole ordeal. Um, but that was kind of like the last I heard about I saw him before we started reading this. And, um, and um, it didn't surprise me because this again is a first comic book, but mm -hmm. you know, there's always going to be structural issues with a first yep. time thing. And, and but on, I feel like, huh? I didn't say, and on that, it's fine that this is his first venture, mm -hmm. if assuming this is his first venture, into creative writing and writing like this, because creative writing is difficult. Creative writing successfully is difficult. Anybody yes. can and start typing <laughs> stuff out, but that doesn't mean the ideas that you have in your head necessarily work out evenly. I've got so many book reviews on this channel, and we've done stuff with like Brady Hendrix, where we're following the stories and the motivation, and stuff doesn't make sense. And if you yeah. enjoy it, regardless of that stuff, that's fine. I love Empress Teresa and it's got plenty of problems, but it is a bang. So like you can enjoy <laughs> stuff however you want. But for me in discussing this, it's been difficult for me to find anybody being honest about it as it's yeah. just, well, this is some, this is his first thing. And also it's not the big three. So it, it's not that bad, but you know, as an author, because I have five books published almost and a, and a couple of short stories. Mm -hmm. And I have read other people's debut novels. Let's talk about Meg Latour. You also have an novel. award for nobody yeah. gave Meg Latour a break for it being her first novel. Yeah, nobody they did. They viciously dogpiled on her too. So, like, that's not really an excuse. And you can love something, but it's just been difficult to find people who read this and said it's fine that it has first issue, first book issues, which it does. It, there's nothing about this book that tells me that it's written by a pro at writing. It tells me all that it's written by somebody who's first venture in writing and it's got first venture issues and yep. that's fine. But it, getting people who are fans of this work to even acknowledge that has been difficult. Yeah, exactly. It's like, I, I'm not a big fan of, a big fan of this mentality with anybody where they refuse, like, because I said to you earlier, I'm a huge freaking fan of Stephen King but my god I know the man has duds and I can admit that he has duds and I can admit when something doesn't work in something that he has written that's just a preference that I have for a lot of things but then there are structural issues he's not as great as he used to be but there are a lot of wackadoo things he used to do back in the day too <laughs> so I understand that the man has his flaws but I, I don't like and I've seen this time and time again with people that watch you know crit drinker or shad's channel you know and i don't have anything against them i really don't 
But I don't like this attitude of they can do no wrong because they are one, these very popular uh, anti mainstream media content creators and they validate the emotions of a bunch of angry people that I, I kind of do feel have the right to be mad about what's happening right now but don't let that blind you from actually thinking critically on mm -hmm. something that has just come out i understand that we want indies to be uplifted but we have to be fair and analyze these things and mm -hmm. point out what's bad and what's good in order to bolster us up and to be taken seriously as a medium which is because also where i see this as a political thing because mm -hmm. i have been in alternate spaces and i have been told that I'm not allowed to opine or critique anything that is by indie people or by people of certain political persuasions mm -hmm. because we're just supposed to praise each other. But or they're I'm, on the same side. But yeah. I'm not a political agent is the problem, is I don't lean in any political direction. I just read and consume and love art and love characters more than yeah. anything else. And so when I read and I am asking and wanting to talk about characters, which Pretty much all I ever want to talk about is characters. Oh That's yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. Like we're <laughs> on like, the same page. Don't worry. <laughs> but if I'm like, guys, I just want this to be honest, and I'm going to be honest in my recognition of things, and yeah. then people come at me for being honest about a book that I read and how I read it the way that I did, and saying, mm -hmm. "Oh, you're only being harsh on it because you're a political actor." That's because there yeah. have been threats against other people that they all fall in line because if you say anything. Then you are assumed to be to be the other side, the other side doing something in quote unquote bad faith, and that's just bullshit. There are people out there that are there are those of us who we're not political, and I don't, we're not. We just we get my tired stories of are for anybody. Look, come yes, and, come to my stories and find love. <laughs> yes, find the love, man. Like for real, and I, I honestly, I've seen this a lot. I think that's what I got spooked by was that. Uh, someone we know had a similar thing happen. I'm not going to name names, but they told him that he couldn't be honest about something he read and after he posted his review of it. And I thought that that was just terrifying because they didn't want uh, the big, they didn't want a, a negative thing said about this person because this person shared their politics. And this was a group of people. This just not much. This wasn't just one person. And I was like, holy crap, the freaking script has been lost and we are off the plot. Like what happened? Um, I don't like that at all. I would prefer to be honest about something and unbiased towards something because of my own beliefs. You know, I don't want to sit here and, and give anything a pass because they share the same political beliefs as I do. I think that's really shallow and insincere. And if we want any kind of success in this and to be taken seriously, and if you want to actually improve yourself as a writer, you have to take the critique and listen to what people are saying, because there really might be something there worthwhile in fixing your work. To help and not you. everybody has helpful critiques. Look for the things no. that help you to accomplish the yeah, things exactly. you want to accomplish and delete everything else. A absolutely. Because you can tell when something is just kind of being, oh, this was something this person had a you know, preferential issue with versus this is actually a structural issue and this is what I would have done to fix this and this might help, hopefully. So there are people out there who want to help you, hopefully, you know. <laughs> but yeah, not every critique is in good faith. That is true. And not every critique is going to help you. But not there every are, critique is in bad faith either. That's also true. Not every critique is in bad faith either, which is a word that has been getting tossed around a lot lately. And I'm just like this. All right, guys, let's not do this. Let everyone calm down and have a civil discussion. <laughs> like, so like, that's all that I've got. If yeah. there are fans of ISOM that have read ISOM, like, all that I care about is always talking characters. You have no idea how long I've waited for like anybody to read my books and then just talk about my characters because I love them <laughs> so much, but right. nobody does. <laughs> but um, I when I was introduced to Isom through the way that he was marketing it, uh -huh. I didn't see anybody talking about who Avery was or who Yara oh. was or who any of these people were or what the story was even about. And even some of the, the streams of watching people, well, what is this about? What is his motivation? There was no discussion crickets. of that. And it's so like, crickets. what is Avery's character? He's arrogant and selfish and bullheaded and he doesn't impulsive. think and impulsive. He, and what is Yara's character? I don't know. She's an angry white woman in yoga pants. <laughs> <laughs> yoga pants. <laughs> Just trying to. Did somebody trying not to give her her on. soy latte and Starbucks? That's what it freaking looks like. And I'm just like, yeah, I don't have any great sense of, 
you know, characterization from the characters. I don't know who they are. I don't know what their motivations are other than these very slim, sloppily put together, Angie. like angry people with their like, Oh, I bet I don't want get, I don't want to get scolded by my mom. Um, so, so if there are ISOM fans that have made it this far into the video, let me know what you like about which characters and why they're your favorites, because that, even if we didn't like it, by hearing what your perspective is and your experience of what you, of how you went through the book, it tells us and informs us of the things that you saw that we didn't see. So just because we have different experiences or don't enjoy or do enjoy something doesn't mean that anybody is terrible. Yeah. It just means we had a different experience and sharing and being able to discuss the things that we saw is what helps us read more critically. Do you have anything else that you would like to add? Um, I guess my opinion is this book is and isn't political like the story itself isn't but the intermission it, it was all kind of done politically it's politically motivated i don't care what anybody says everything that has been around this comic has been political that's what i want to say like i have seen and heard lots of stories um and i have not like you said earlier everything else about this comic no one's talked about avery no one's talked about yara no one's talked about Mar darren or or jim or uh, altana like nobody's talked about them, but I think that hopefully the next issue will be a little bit more conducive and like cohesive and easy to follow. And what you um, said on that is exactly why I wanted to read it because it is so hard. And it's the same reason why I picked up many mm -hmm. of the ALA books is because when there is drama around something or especially political drama, like the banned books debate with the ALA mm -hmm. books. And then with this, it's hard to know what exactly is in the book because you're going to have the the wanting to jump on it because you're against the creator of the content, but then you're going to have the overcorrection of mm -hmm. also not necessarily being truth true to what's in it because you want to support the the person. Like I've yeah. seen this with smut books too, where a smut artist will say or a smut writer says, "Hey, I've been canceled, banned books, blah blah blah." but they don't tell you what's in the book. So they sell you on that band thing. And then you end up. It gets people's emotions running because nobody likes the idea of a banned book. You know, it's, they it's don't like, tell it's, you that it was banned for breaking TOS or, you know, being too young, being too mature for the, I don't know, the people that's being distributed to. Yeah. Like they lie about it. Like you really, people please look into the things that you're hearing and don't just take everything at face value, actually see what's going on and do your own legwork. And, then you might you will get to the truth so don't just take someone's word for it go and seek the truth yourself because i saw this book and it was nothing and everything about this book has been nothing but a political discussion and um, hey if you get a different if you are not sure about whether to listen to us, that that includes not listening to us too if you want to go yeah. and read the book for yourself do it form your own opinion and let us know yep and that's, that's all I have to, that's all I got to say. I'm sorry. Excuse me with, for interrupting. <laughs> with that said, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Thank you for being here, Monty. Oh, no discussion. problem. It was, a, it was a pleasure. I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of laughs and a lot of fun. And I really do love talking about characters and stories. Yep. And I learn a lot from listening to what your observations are too and comparing our observations. Oh, I love that. That was so much fun. Like the whole, well, anyway, you know, we'll talk that, about it. With that said, thank you so much, everybody. Have a great weekend and don't die. Hello, boomers! My name is Yananananana. How are you feeling today? In case you didn't know, I'm a YouTuber from Nide, a small town in eastern Ukraine. My family has never really understood what I do in the woods, but all I've ever wanted is to make a better life for us all. Papa always comes home from the mines dirty, angry, and tired. It's a necessary evil to do your job and be in a place that you don't want to be. But I've never wanted to spend my life doing exactly what was necessary of me. Everything changed for me when a couple of Americans appeared at my door. They said they wanted to sponsor my channel and handed me military-grade explosives. Can you believe it? Military-grade. The lights will be incredible going forward. With this help, my videos will be next level. I just hope they are as they say, and this isn't some kind of trick. I mean, what would there be to gain? Boris says people are simple. Everything comes down to money and power. And Alex tells me ignorance will not save me from trouble. I understand where they are coming from, but I do not like to think that way. There is more to life than a cruel of superficial goods, hatred, 
and destruction. Anyway, I do not like where this video is going. So I will see you on the explosives field. Boom, boom, boom. Salute.